It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, extreme conditions, brutal heat blankets the southern United States with temperatures soaring as high as 120 degrees. This summer is worse than, than all of the past summers. The humidity is what, what kills you. As the Northeast recovers from devastating floods, some communities still underwater with more storms on the way. We'll have the full forecast. Plus, real warning. Bill Gates weighs in on the dangers of artificial intelligence and the misinformation risks that come along with it. What he's saying to watch out for, along with some potential hope on the horizon. Then in the house, Andy Cohen's here along with a new groundbreaking housewife, Jenna Lyons. The pair are keeping it real with a breakdown of all the drama, fashion, and fun in store. And let's go, girls. My one-on-one -on -one with Shania Twain, where we go behind the scenes and take center stage. Please welcome to the stage my good friend, Hoda! Singing with the superstar. Still want I kiss. Good night. Along with something a little special. But I'm actually here for another reason to surprise you with a little something. Today, Wednesday, July the 12th, 2023. <laughs> Celebrating our anniversary. Married for 33 years. Singing in the mirror like it's Hollywood. From Chico, California. We're on a mother-daughter trip. Sending love to our parents in Iowa. We love you, Grandma and Papa. Hi, Mom and Dad. Watching from Hazlitt, New Jersey. It's Brooklyn's golden birthday. I'm turning 12 today. Oh. It's time. We're back, 8.14. This is the story we've been talking about all yes. morning, looking forward to all morning. Okay, we all know that Shania Twain is music royalty. So, her 1997 album, Come On Over, the bi biggest selling album of all time by a solo female artist. And last night, I had a chance to join Shania at a sold out Madison Square Garden for a huge surprise on her hugely successful Queen of Me tour. And let me tell you, after watching the fans go incredibly wild for Shania, it's clear she's still the one. It does feel like I'm having the time yeah. of my life. I'm so enjoying it, I'm absorbing it. I'm really looking at the people, really looking at them, observing them. And for almost three decades, music legend Shania Twain has been giving them something to look at. But there's been something different about this Shania of her latest tour, Queen of Me. She says she's never felt freer. You are immersed. I mean, you are in it. You might as well be crowd surfing. I feel like you're like that kind, you're right in it. I, I feel more appreciative now, I mm. think, than, than ever in my career. I'm celebrating, uh, you know, loving my voice and, and the way I sing. It's very satisfying to me to be able to sing out and mm -hmm. express myself through my voice again without any reservation and any mm. fear. Is there one song when you pick up the mic and you go, this one always feels the sweetest? Well, you're still the one as always. You're still the one. You're still the one. I think it means so much more after COVID as well, because the whole world has been through very recently mm -hmm. such an intense uh, struggle. Mm -hmm. And so coming out on the other side of that, we have all that we're making it, mm -hmm. you know, against the odds. Mm -hmm. The song champions togetherness. This is your actual wardrobe. Speaking of togetherness, I was about to experience a whole lot of it with Shania backstage in her dressing room. This is what I call pink yeah. Elvis. Oh my God. I went in thinking that we were going to see what she would be wearing. Uh, not sure what's happening, but I like it. As it turns out, Shania had other plans. Oh my God, am I wearing an outfit? I'm over here. Okay, what's happening? I have underwear on. <laughs> I have underwear on, seriously. They're trunks. 
Their performance. This is hilarious. They're just pride. Totally normal. You know that newfound fearlessness we were just talking about? I'm going to pee my pants. Seriously. Oh, my, my I'm sorry to pee my trunks. Okay, I'm going to wear it, but can I wear some pants under it? I had to find some for myself and fast. Cross your legs and just let this, you know, let this be part of your, your life right now. <laughs> look at the camera. <sighs> okay. Like, look how pretty it is with her hair. She's gorgeous. <sighs> this has been the best. I was in Shania's hands now. Let's go. And suddenly found myself headed out on stage in front of 20,000 screaming Shania fans. Now, before I do this next song, I want to introduce someone that I've loved for many years. We've been good friends for a long, long time, and we text about all kinds of things, staying in touch, but there's nothing like being in person together. Please welcome to the stage my good friend, Hoda! First of all, I want to say thank you, but I'm actually here for another reason, to surprise you with a little something. I had the honor of presenting Shania with a double diamond platinum record for her 1997 breakthrough album, Come On Over. And then she had a surprise for us, the announcement of the reissuing of Come On Over on August 25th. So you guys are the first to know. I'm very excited about it. It's really amazing how music can go this full cycle and live through generations. So, and that's of course all because of you, thanks to you. And what happened next would go on to stun me. Hoda, after all these years of knowing you, mm -hmm. we're finally gonna sing together. Still the one that I love. The only one I dream of, still the one I kiss. Good night. As I left the stage, I knew that moment, that magic, would stay with me for a lifetime. It was just so incredibly moving and beautiful. It's like you, there are moments you dream about happening. And about her generous spirit. So it was 15 minutes before showtime and mm -hmm. she was like, let me see your outfit, come here. Yeah. Okay, we need, she had a towel on. She was like, let me fix you up, let me cut. <laughs> I go, yeah, I, I go, I, th I, think, I think you got 15 you minutes time. before you go. She was like, no, will someone get her some more jewelry? Yeah. She still, even in that moment, oh she is so caring oh. and loving. Mm -hmm. When she said, when you go up the stairs, don't be nervous. Yeah. You walk, I'll show you, will you show her? And anyway, I felt loved and cared for and I think she's amazing. And I get why generations oh. keep yeah. coming back. Oh it's an awesome well, show. You she loves you, yeah. and, and by the way, you just dispelled <laughs> a, a lie. You've said for years that you can't, can't sing. Well, and, like, and, and, and we heard you. It was a combination of mouthing and panic. No, <laughs> no, no, no. You were doing it. I mean, okay, <laughs> Billy Joel, uh, Bruce Springsteen, <laughs> yeah. Stevie Wonder, Hoda Kotb, oh, all performing on the TV That's Turner, right. All perform on the stage it, at Madison it, Square Garden. It was, a, it was a, something I'll never. What was that like looking out and seeing that crowd? It was so bizarre, Al. I'd never seen anything like it. I couldn't even imagine um, what that must have been like to be her, even for that 15 seconds. Yeah. That's it amazing. Was, it was really cool. There was that. Cool. Phase in your life where you were marrying people. You remember that? Oh, yeah. You were, yeah. I think you're going to have a new phase. You're going to start getting requests to oh, yeah. show up and perform. That's All right. right. So, if, by the way, uh, Shania is going to be on her Queen of Me tour through November. So, catch her if you can. It's such a fun concert. And again, the re release of Come On Over so drops August 25th. I, I get, that was so cool. That was so fun. That's a bucket Thank list moment. Yeah. Check, check. Thank you. That was great. <laughs>
We are back now, 8.35 on this Wednesday morning with your health. And this morning, a closer look at a drug that treats Alzheimer's. And it's that drug that just received full approval from the FDA. Yeah, our good friend Maria Shriver is here with more. Good morning, Maria. Good morning, Maria. Good to everybody. Good to it's so nice to see everybody. Well, the drug is called Lecanemab, the first FDA-approved treatment that slows cognitive decline in some Alzheimer's patients. But there are still serious questions about its long-term efficacy and safety. So we're taking a deeper look at it and have everything you need to know. Some call it a revolution in Alzheimer's treatment. This gives hope. It's momentous. For the first time in history, the FDA giving full approval to a drug that targets the underlying causes of Alzheimer's. It's called Lecanemab, or the brand name Lecembe. It's a twice a month infusion treatment for people in the earliest stages of the disease, suffering from mild cognitive impairment. They make up about one third of all Alzheimer's patients. The drug works by reducing amyloid plaques in the brain, which researchers say may be a root cause of Alzheimer's. In a study of nearly 1,800 people with early Alzheimer's, the drug slowed cognitive decline in patients by 27% over a year and a half. Dr. Joanne Pike is CEO of the Alzheimer's Association. This is pivotal. But it also should be cautioned that this is not reversing Alzheimer's. This is not going to slow it down if you're a year or two years into your journey, correct? This is not a cure, correct. Um, and in fact, it slows down progress at the earliest stages for a period of time. Patient Zell Bachnick says the drug has given him more time with his wife, Gail, before his mind fades away. Taking this drug has given me a lot of confidence. Zell's memory had been declining for years. Diagnosed with early Alzheimer's, he joined the study and has been getting lecanemab infusions every two weeks for the last two years. Since he began treatment, tests show his cognitive abilities haven't declined at all, allowing him at age 89 to continue his active lifestyle. You may get shocked, but I still ski winter in winter, winter skiing. And I'm looking forward to this winter coming up. You ski? Yes, downhill skiing. But he's not allowed to do double diamonds or moguls anymore. <laughs> Lecanemab does come with risks. In the clinical trial, 12% of patients had brain swelling and 17% brain bleeding. Dr. Jason Karlowish is an Alzheimer's expert at the University of Pennsylvania. Many people hear brain bleed, swelling of the brain, and go like, whoa, not for me. Why would anybody want to do that? I'm concerned, but I, I, I would dampen that immediate fear. These can be detected before they cause harm. But he says that will require rigorous pre-screening of patients, and once on the drug, close monitoring of them for adverse effects. Experts say lecanemab is not appropriate for anyone in the more advanced stages of Alzheimer's and could be dangerous for those on blood thinners or who carry the APOE4 Alzheimer's gene. There can be harms to people. In the absence of a skilled practitioner, in the absence of a well-educated patient and family, you don't know their APOE genotype, which raises the risk. Things could go wrong really bad. Long term, the drug safety and efficacy are still unknown, and it's expensive, around $26,000 a year, though full FDA approval means Medicare will cover it, with some conditions. While it's not a cure, the Bachniks say the drug gives families like them something they desperately need, a ray of light in the long and dark tunnel of this disease. It gives people hope that there is life after these diagnoses that you can move forward. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services say it will cover this drug, which is expensive, only if doctors enroll patients in the registry to track their progress on it. That is something that the Alzheimer's Association has opposed because they say some doctors refuse to use registries. And finding a doctor who does could be a challenge in some areas, but other people think having a registry is how we'll get the data track, that this yeah. drug needs. Yeah, so if you have someone in your family and you're seeing a little bit of cognitive decline and you're thinking, wow, this might be the drug they need. That could be what the drug. Should, yeah, what should they do? Well, first they should get 
get tested, they should yeah. seek out an Alzheimer's expert, and that's okay. hard because there are not a lot of them, mm -hmm. but the Alzheimer's Association can help you, uh, direct you to some people in your area. The tests are extensive, mm -hmm. and then everybody has to make this decision for themselves. But this is the only thing that's out there right now that if you do have mild cognitive impairment, if you're at the beginning, they can mm -hmm. help you. Could this okay. be the start of other drug companies saying, hey, Maybe yeah. there's something to be done. I there. think so, and I think that people are hopeful as yeah. they people are using the word game changer, watershed yeah. moment. They're hopeful that more companies will say, like, let's invest mm -hmm. because the the investments of the past have yielded nothing, and now they're saying, okay, well, maybe there's hope. Okay. And hope is a big thing. Hope yes. is a game changer. Yes. Hope is. Hope is yeah. a game changer. All right, Maria, thank you. And you're going to come back in the fourth hour, right? I'm going to come back in the, the third, third hour. hour. Well, and, and the fourth the third hour. hour. And I had to leave with the four. Okay. <laughs> We're going to talk about Two. menopause in the four. Well, let's do it. Wow, okay. I think Alan Craig should come for that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, With another special Prime Day edition of today's bestsellers, Amazon wrapping up its biggest sales event of the year, and we're going to share some of our favorite bargains, all under 25 bucks. Shop today. Editorial director Adriana Brock is here. All right, so let's fire up that QR code yes. and dive into the deals with fire being the operative word. Yes, Al, I love that intro. Today we are highlighting deals under $25. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was all about the big ticket items. Fire Stick, this is a great one. Amazon devices are always mm -hmm. on sale for Prime sure. Day. That comes with the territory. This one is just $16.99. Wow. That's 58% off. Mm -hmm. What we love about the Fire Stick is that it's this tiny little device mm -hmm. that can upgrade your TV in a big way. You get all your streaming, right. all your movies, all your TV shows. So this shows. goes into the HDMI port exactly. on your TV? Exactly, on your TV. It's easy as that. The remote is also genius because it has the Alexa voice command. Oh. So you could just uh -huh. fire it up, say, Alexa, turn on the show. And Today I love show. your idea. That one of the reasons why you like this is its portability. Its portability is great. We were... Um, at a, on a vacation last week and we were like, what's our password for this streaming service? Or what's our password for this? You know what? If you Just unplug plug this, in, bring it in, you have all your TV. stuff Very with you. Nice. Exactly. Okay, so what's this deal? Okay, this one's one that my mom found for me and actually a really great one for Read With Jenna readers out there. Oh. Jenna also found this one as well, uh -huh. and it's a neck lamp. So you literally just oh. put it around your neck. Uh -huh. Right now it's under 20 bucks, super affordable. Not only great as a reading lamp, uh -huh. but also I use it when I paint my nails or if I'm fixing things around the house and you need a little extra light. Right. This is a good one. I also hang and I would it. I think this could also be really annoying to your friends. It, you could be annoying <laughs> like that, yeah. You could use it as a nightlight, run around the house. I love that. <laughs> All righty, here we go. Let's char get charged on this. Okay. Al, what's your tagline? ABC, always, always be, be charging. charging. Exactly. This one is for you because it is a pack of not one, but two 
fast, high-speed chargers oh. mm -hmm. for just $13.90. That's 30% off. You can charge your phone from 0% if you're mm -hmm. like me and you let your phone get down to 0% right. to 50% in 30 minutes. Wow. It charges three times faster than regular chargers. And you get two of them. And you get two of them. That's so you nice. can share one with a friend who can all also be ABC. Well, probiotics and super foods. <laughs> yes. So beauty is buzzing with a ton of really popular ingredients. Tula is a really great brand that mm -hmm. people really love. I like this eye stick right now. It's 30% off, just $21 because it's solid. So you use it under your eyes to cool and depuff in the morning. Uh -huh. Everyone can use it. I like also really deep good. Yes. Also really good for travel because uh -huh. you don't have to worry about liquids. All right. Now, what, what? tell me the deal on this oil. Okay. Argan oil is super popular right mm. now. And this one is just $10.49. That's 30% off. What do you do with it? You can use it from head to toe. Uh -huh. So you can use it to moisturize, nourish your skin. You can also use it on your cuticles, elbows, knees, any areas that need extra moisture. Uh -huh. Another great hack, use it in your hair. Oh. For some of us who have long hair. Or on gets, your scalp. Or on your scalp. You Listen, our hair gets brittle in the summer and you need a little bit extra. Now, what are these? Okay, these are what we're calling the cloud slippers. These uh -huh. are super popular for men and women. Feel them, they're light as a feather. Oh, wow. And feel like a cloud on your feet. Uh -huh. Not a literal cloud, but no, you know, but just enough. as comfy. They're indoor, outdoor slippers. Just $20.30. 39 cents. That's 43% off. These went viral on Instagram and have 25,000 perfect five star reviews on oh, Amazon wow. right now. Cool. So these are the trending product everyone's uh -huh. picking up today. And then last but not least, what are, what are the little egg bites? What okay. Are the deals here? You know those sous vide egg bites that you can buy? At, oh, yeah, yeah. At, you buy them at the, the different coffee shops. Exactly. Yeah. They're super fancy. They're really great. They can get pricey, so make them at home with the, this little uh, oh. device. What you do, you can make four egg bites, or mm -hmm. you can make one sandwich size egg. You oh, pour wow. a little bit of water in there, uh -huh. you put in some scrambled eggs, and you can make those delicious protein packed breakfast on the go in no time. That is really and cool. And it's it comes super with easy. Like these two different inserts? It comes with the two inserts, so you can make a, a big sandwich size or the bites, and under 25 bucks, Great you can't stuff. go wrong. All right, well, everything you need from, from A to Z, it's all right here. Yeah. Hey, Verona, thank you so much. To find these deals and more, scan the QR code, or you can head to today.com slash Prime Day, and just so you know, today earns a commission from purchases made through our links. The highly anticipated season 14 of The Real Housewives of New York City, almost here. Got a brand new cast, Andy Cohen, of course, our friend, executive producer. No stranger to the hit shows, nearly two decades worth of drama. We got Jenna Lyons here. She is the former president and creative director of J. Crew, who can now add the title of Real Housewife to a resume. <laughs> Andy, Hoes. season 14. Season 14. Okay, how does it feel? Like, is, is every season like, oh my gosh, it's a new baby. Well, Here this we really go. is a new baby yeah. because we've taken a beloved member of the Housewives franchise yes. and totally rebooted it mm -hmm. with a group of fresh, energetic, yes. fashionable, aspirational, brilliant women. Jenna at the forefront. Uh, Jenna, <laughs> How did you of get course. Jenna to do it. Well, it's kind of incredible. I mean, look at him. We had a How couple, can I say no? <laughs> we had a few long conversations, yes. <laughs> come to Jesus conversations, yes. as yes. they were. And Jenna went in for the trust fall, and I'm so glad she did because she is a brilliant. 
brilliant Real Housewife. And the show is wonderful and it's fun to watch. And I think for people who've always loved The Housewives, yeah. this gives people what they love about the show, but it's yeah. fresh and new, it's dramatic, it's funny, and it's New York. So everyone has a vibe about them, Jenna, yes. um, on the show. Yes. Some, sometimes there's the funny one, the ditzy one, the mean one. What one are you? I think I'm the cold one. The cold one? <laughs> I didn't mean to, but I'm a little bit more reserved. I think I was just nervous. It's, yeah. It's intense, but I I, I warm up. I'm, I'm also, the cold one. I think <laughs> that's funny. I know, but I think I actually get more vulnerable. I cry. She I laugh. does. I do everything you think I wouldn't do. Now, let me ask you, yeah. why did you say yes? I know Andy's very convincing, but aside yeah. from the charm, I, what made you say yes? I think two this? things. I think that the franchise has been really beloved. It feels like a part yeah. of New York. I remember when it first came out, and I was so excited about it. And what I loved was that this time they were bringing on a totally different group. This was not about like doing what they've done before. When bringing I spoke, one person in. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it felt like it was a total yeah. change up, and the cast is very diverse in age, in ethnicity in look and feel and style and personality. And that, to me, was a big game changer in terms of the way that the show... So, Andy, when you are choosing, do you, by the way, are you the guy? Do you go yes, no, yes, There's no? There's a team. I'm on it. And mm -hmm. it's a great team. And we've been doing it for a, a while. And in doing it, you know, look, we wanted everything that Jenna said. We also wanted a group. I think when you watch yeah. the show uh, on Sunday night on Bravo and then Peacock, when it premieres, you're going to see a cohesive group. And I think it was a, you know, bringing out a new group yeah. of Real Housewives of New York. It was a tough thing to reboot, mm -hmm. but we did it. And the group is really something else. I just remembered suddenly something Kathy Lee said to me a long time ago. She said, it's can I have more wine? <laughs> <laughs> she said, can I have she said, more wine? <laughs> she said, it's not about you being a great personality or you. She used to say this about me and her. She said, it's always about what's in between. Yes. It's about the space yes. in between. The it's and so that's, true. that's what, so what is the, what's the vibe like I of the housewives? I think the thing that I found most interesting is that you go into it thinking you know someone and what happens is you very clearly see quickly that you don't know people yeah. and what you assume and what you expect are not what you find. What's also interesting is that Jenna now is seeing the episodes yes. for the first time. So and she's now seeing what her friends oh, said about her oh, about behind you. her back. Do you still like them? Yes. So, Some of them? Okay, wait. Now, all these celebs love watching The Housewives. Yes. We recently had John, John Hamm on yes. our show. My St. Louis brother. I love John He Hamm. loves you, but let's take a look at what he said about The Housewives. So I read something very interesting about you this morning, John Hamm, and it surprised me, to okay. be honest. I heard that you like the Real Housewives franchise. Is that a Brother. fact, or is that faux news? No, that's 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 real. It's a real? I would, I would say yes. I've been, I've been... Which in, ones in, are in you into? Well, I'm, 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 I'm a Jersey man. I'm a Vanderpumper. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Beverly Hillsian. Oh, my God. I like New York. We'll see what this whole new New York thing yeah, is all about. I know. Okay. That's right. Yeah, John Hamm's up for the ride. By the way, so many celebs come on your show and talk about talk about this. Who's yeah. like the biggest celeb who watches The Housewives? Well, I think I, I mean Rihanna's fandom yeah. of Bravo and The Housewives is the thing that still kind of blows me away. I mean, she's. I mean, listen, I'm <laughs> shocked, but also Jennifer Lawrence, another one yes. I would not have expected, and I think Michelle Obama said that she watched. Yes. Yes, yeah, she dabbles. She dabbles. Yes, Andy, she's Jenna. in the Potomac. <laughs> okay, know. we can't wait. By the way, catch the season premiere of The Real Houses of New York City, Sunday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, on our sister network, Bravo. And as Andy pointed out so well, streaming on Peacock. Yes. We love Hodes. you, Andy. Love you. Okay. You look great. You killed it with Shania. Oh, my God. Killed it. Was, it. Thank you. I'm so glad <laughs> you didn't it. wear that light pink outfit. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Not good. Okay, we're back with the third and fourth hours of today, including Olympic legend Sean White live in our studio. But first, a check of your local news and weather. This morning on the third hour of today, a new weapon in the fight against Alzheimer's. For the first time ever, the FDA approving a drug to help slow the disease, what all families need to know. Plus, era message. Taylor Swift fans furious with Ticketmaster again. I spent the entire 10 minute countdown trying to log in. The new meltdown that caused more bad blood and shut out thousands of Swifties from getting concert tickets. Then later, Olympic great Sean White live in studio, bringing us an inside look at his rise and career like never before. And oh baby, there's a little star in the house. We're going gaga for the 2023 Gerber baby. Today, Wednesday, July 12th, 
2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. And good morning. Welcome to the third hour of today. I'm Al along with Chanel. Craig Dillon is off. And we are so thrilled to have Maria. our today's special anchor, Maria Schreiber. Hi. I'm so happy to be here so with three of my you. favorite people. I'm great. I know. How summer? Summer is great. I was over in Berlin for the Special Olympics, yes. and now oh, yes. I'm here with you. So I'm having a great summer. I'm feeling great. Well, we love it when, you, when yes. you're when you here. It's funny. You can hear the buzz of the building. Maria's here. Maria's yeah. here. <laughs> but she's also here because she is a champion, of course, for Alzheimer's research. And here's the news this morning. The FDA just approved a new drug to fight the disease. We've been talking about this. It's called Lakembi. Experts are cautioning it is not a cure, but it's aimed at slowing the progression of Alzheimer's in the early stages. So, Maria, I know you are not a doctor, yes, I'm but not just a talk, doctor. But talk I don't about even why. One on yeah, you don't even, yeah. Exactly. But why is the medical community excited about this one? Well, I think millions of people are excited about this because there has been a lot of research in the Alzheimer's space and it's usually come up empty. So, I think getting this approved, getting Medicare to cover it because it's an expensive drug as long as you participate in the registry offers hope to millions of families, particularly at the front end of this disease. This is for people with mild cognitive impairment. This is not for people at the end of the Alzheimer's journey. Mm -hmm. It is not a cure. Uh, there is a lot to be excited about, but there's also a lot to be cautious about. I mean, you know, more than six and a half million Americans are, are dealing with Alzheimer's, and that number doesn't even include the caretakers. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but and we've talked a little bit about this in the past. Why do you think that we've been able to make such strides with other diseases, whether it be cancer or, or other illnesses, but not so much with Alzheimer's. The Why do you think that is? It's complicated, mm -hmm. right? All of us have different brains, right? And I think it's a complicated disease. I think in the beginning, they always looked at people at the end of the disease. They were studying just plaques and tangles. Now there's a lot more emphasis on lifestyle. They're trying to get people to focus on brain health in their 30s, their 40s. All of us should be living a brain healthy lifestyle. So I think they're changing where they're looking. They're including more women because this disease disproportionately impacts women and mm. people of color. Getting people like that into trials is really important. They hadn't done that before. So I think they're trying to broaden what they're looking at. Well, we'll talk about a little bit more about lifestyle, Maria, because uh -huh. that seems to be really important. I mean, just for everybody in general, but yes. especially when you talk about a brain healthy lifestyle, what is that? And when should we start looking at this? Well, I think you have to start living it in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, if you want to be healthy in your 60s, 70s, and 80s. That's really important. They think about almost half of Alzheimer's uh, cases could be preventable really? if people adapted a brain-healthy lifestyle is, early on, which is prioritizing one's sleep, getting exercise, putting blood flow to the brain, checking your hearing. This is also a big space. Hearing? Uh, hearing. And uh, getting people to, because if you have poor hearing, the brain is struggling to oh. hear. So getting people to check their hearing in their 40s and 50s, encouraging them that they will wear a hearing aid is also really important. Encouraging people to lifelong learners. What you eat matters. What you eat matters. Getting people off of the traditional American diet of processed foods. Yeah, so more like it, that blue zone that you Blue zone, about? you know, Mediterranean food. I was just, as I said, at the Special Olympics in Berlin, and people are moving constantly, right? They're walking. They're they're not necessarily going to the gym like yeah, we talk right. about here, but they're they're kind of have a movement. It's part of their part life. Of their life, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So I think Americans have a highly processed diet. They have a sedentary lifestyle. So getting people to get up and move is a really important part of a brain healthy lifestyle. What's most promising to you? I feel like you've been, you know, talking about this for, in this fight for time. more than 20 plus years. Yes. Yeah. And so I admire you. I've watched you. You see, I just ordered mosh bars or, yeah. you know, whatever it is. I'm like trying to figure out how we can preserve mm -hmm. our brain health. Well, that's why I try to kind of talk to people at all different uh, decades of their lives because our health changes really by the decade. So mm -hmm. what we eat matters, how we prioritize sleep, how we deal with stress matters. I'm trying to really get people to focus on women's health. Mm -hmm. uh, women have this whole trajectory of health beyond their childbearing years. What effect does 
you know, hormones have sure. on the brain, all of these things. So it's a exploding space. Uh, we need more geriatric. We yes. were talking about that. Mm -hmm. We need more Alzheimer's experts. We need more geriatric uh, doctors uh, getting people into this space as more and more boomers age, getting yeah. people to look at caregiving as a viable profession. There's a lot to be excited about, a lot to talk about in this yeah. space. But I think also getting a successful drug like this into yeah. the marketplace, getting Hopefully Medicare to cover effect. it, because as I said, it's expensive. Yeah. And so for people who don't have the money to take it, that's a big win. Right. But this is certainly a lot of hope. Absolutely. You know, a lot of hope. Happy we're having yeah, a conversation. Gotta have hope. Don't go anywhere. Thank you. That's right. Yeah, we don't want you to leave anywhere. because uh, we got another story. There's there's drama now between Ticketmaster oh. and Taylor Swift fans. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Our resident Taylor Swift expert, NBC's Emily Aketa, is here to fill us in. Emily, tell us about this. <laughs> this is such a breaking big news story. <laughs> yeah, big breaking news to bring you guys this morning. The Taylor Swift phenomenon is going global. Tickets for her European tour went on sale. Sale. And just like here in the United States, Ticketmaster ran into some challenges. And now her fans are sounding off. Seeing the Eras Tour live is a dream for so many Swifties around the world. But it's hard to do just that, as Ticketmaster's troubles selling Taylor Swift tickets have now also emerged abroad in Europe. On Tuesday, the company paused sales to Swift's six shows in Paris and Lyon, France next year. Ticketmaster says an issue with a third party provider is to blame, adding as soon as we saw fans experiencing issues, queues were paused. All codes not used to purchase tickets will remain valid. I got the lucky space of 463,506. When I got that email, um, a few hours later saying that the entire site was <laughs> that, they're, that they're pausing ticket sales. Um, that was very shocking. This dilemma hard to shake off for Swifties that watched the Eras Tour Ticketmaster meltdown unfold in the U.S. last fall. I had the tickets in my cart, the exact tickets that I wanted, and then I spent the entire 10 minute countdown trying to log in. Zoe McCormick lives in Paris and says she took off work Tuesday to purchase Eras Tour tickets. I was so, so sad, so disappointed that this was happening again after everything that had happened in the U.S. Last November, Ticketmaster ultimately canceled the general sale for Swift's United States tour after a massive presale rush and bot attacks caused the site to glitch. The problem, it's me. Some fans waited for hours in virtual My queues license. only to see error codes sending them to the back of the virtual line. For many, eventual heartbreak. This is history here. We've never seen the demand for this kind of tour before. A Ticketmaster can only afford to blow this so many times. Ticketmaster's technical issues and control of the market, even taking center stage at a Senate hearing earlier this year. We apologize to the fans. We apologize to Ms. Swift. We need to do better. I can still make the whole place shimmer. For now, Swifties are staying hopeful, saying they'll be enchanted if they can just land a ticket. I just want to be there and I want to dance with my friends. I'm still staying positive. Okay, so at this point, Ticketmaster has not announced a new on-sale time for those France shows, and so far, no reaction from Taylor Swift. Last time, she said it was excruciating to watch when fans in the U.S. face similar long wait times. Since then, Ticketmaster announced it will begin all-in pricing in September to eliminate hidden fees. So, you know, when you get to the car and suddenly you're like, where did this extra $80 come mm -hmm. from? Yes. So we should be able to see that more up front. But you saw months. her, didn't you? I did see her. You did see her? Yes. Where, where did you see her? Yes. Uh, well, I got to see part of her concert in Philadelphia. Yeah. And I've spent a lot of time outside of the venues yeah. with like yeah. tailgating. Come on. The tailgating, yeah. Even if you're, you know, want, hopefully, you know, the, the agency figures it out. But the reality is there are more people who want to attend. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Tickets are available. So some people so may be disappointed. You know, I've always been to concerts Supply people want to go to, and they can't get but tickets. But you know, it's funny. Get over it. No, it's not. Grow <laughs> up. No. Wow. No, go see something else. But we got some go strong emotions on this. Take a walk. Some strong emotions. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Oh, no, I couldn't so get so into Taylor Swift. So, so <laughs> Time out. Or if you, or out. maybe people should just stop going to TikTok and, like, crying about it. No. Yeah. <laughs> just, maybe that's. These things happen. No sympathy over here. This is what I will say. I remember when Beyonce was doing her tickets, right? People were like, oh, you have to have connections. Or even for me, they were like, oh, we know she you have connections. I'm like, no, I logged on. I was waiting out. I was yeah. like, I and I 
In fact, I took a picture of my phone every time. I was 2,000th in line. I Look at that. Oh, my children. gosh. And, yes, I, and Mama was in the corner. I and I went to Beyonce, too. See, then I moved great. up to 520. Yeah. But with patience. And you, and you got it. And Victor, you got your it, it feels good, though, when you yes. get it. Why, don't yuck my yum. Al, Roker, is there, oh, any, is there anyone that you would... Like wait in line. Like Nine hours for takeoff or work. No, I'm sorry. I, I listen. Earth, wind, and fire. I, I, but you know. I, so if I get a ticket way up in the rafter, Paul McCartney. I, he's oh. like, now here's the difference, though. Here's the difference. the difference. He doesn't have to wait in exactly. line. Exactly. That's the thing. He picks up the phone. He's like, No, I don't. No, no I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't. Al, I love to come see you. That's why he has no sympathy. Yeah. By the way, no. By the way, don't when I went to see, that when I went to see Elton Al. John, I went online yeah. and I ordered tickets. And then oh, when he got okay. to the arena, Elton's like. No, no, Elton didn't even know I was there. Row. Elton didn't know I was there. We're moving on now. Okay, gosh. Okay, but I go See what you've been missing? Wow. I go I'm gonna go online. get some coffee. Emily, God. thank you so much. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Maria, it was always good. I'm yeah. sorry you had to wait. I'm sorry I had to see this really, family fight like this. But, but, <laughs> but you, there was breathe, no fight. Breathe. But you will be back with Hogan yeah. Jenner where I'm sure it will yes, be much calmer. It's going to be so very, lovely. yes, we're talking about menopause. Right. There you go. Oh. <laughs> he wants to change the subject. No, no, I think, no, no, that's an important topic. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Of course, we are out of time and coming up next, Consumer Confidential on Customer Service. Man, that was a hard turn. You did it, though. fire. How to get a real person on the phone without pressing zero over and over. Oh. Vicky Wynn is going to save this show. And then, <laughs> and then later, oh. we have some exclusive baby news, folks. Jesus. This oh. year's Gerber baby, oh. live in studio oh. with her proud. That is an adorable little girl. Oh, my gosh. Sad. That's why she's the Gerber baby. Baby. Third hour of today, right back after this, hopefully. Oh, precious. She doesn't cry. This morning in our Consumer Confidential, we want to talk customer service. Whether you're trying to change your flight, fix your internet, get Taylor Swift tickets, the process can be infuriating. So our senior consumer and investigative correspondent, Vicki Wynn, is here to help. Good morning, Vicki. Good morning. I knew you were going to bring up Tay-Tay. I wish I had the answers there, but I'll just disclaimer, I can't help with that. Tay -tay. Oh, boy. Okay, so <laughs> summer, full swing, travel plans, weather's in, uh, impacting things. Yeah. Okay, so your vacation takes a hit. What yes. do you do? What's so the first thing? So if you're at the airport and your flight gets delayed out or canceled, you're going to act fast and multitask. I yes. want you on your phone. I want you walking to the customer service line, mm -hmm. the self-service kiosk, or if you're a lounge member, you can check there because yeah. sometimes the lines are shorter. Right. But while you're standing in that line, you are also chatting with the customer service rep on the app for that airline. You are also on the phone. And if you have teenagers, they can chip they in too. There you go. They can start That's doing some research. What are alternate flights? What are different destinations? Where can we get to? So when you get to the counter or you get a person on the phone, you, you're presenting I think them great with advice. options to help. By the way, the baby, quicker. the Gerber baby, still. The Gerber, the Gerber <laughs> baby agrees with that. I love that. I love and that. then also, if you booked through a third party, an Expedia or a Travelocity, make sure you read the fine print and you know who you're supposed to call because often they're the ones that are going to have to help you fix it, not the airline directly. Here's my question. How do you get to a real person, like the okay. quickest? This is so important. First, again, it starts with the research. So let's say you need to rebook something. Don't just go to the general customer service line. Mm -hmm. Google Marriott rebooking number. Maybe you're going to get a more specific tailored phone number yes. that can first start you off with the right number. Then 
it, we talk about this. Sometimes there's a number for Canadians. There's a number for an international number. It's often an 800 number. Be careful because if it is an actual international code, you might be charged more for, on your cell phone, but it might be worth it in terms of the time yep. savings and yeah. getting rebooked. So try that. Does it not matter? It, it doesn't matter sometimes depending on your cell phone plan. Okay. So that's the caveat. Right. Uh, if you speak another language, para espanol o prima dos, get on that. Go to the oh. Spanish line because often you'll get to someone sooner. So that's great. <laughs> And then, okay, zero, 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 that can work as a menu shortcut. Like representative, pound, representative. Pound. Exactly, saying representative, if it's a voice style call, those are ways to get to a human. If ever, it's, if you would like to start a new service, if you would like to place a new order, press one, press two, yeah. do that. You're gonna get to a live human being who wants mm. to sell you something. Oh. It's not the right person, oh. but yeah. then you're in the system and you can ask nicely, could you please transfer me to the customer That's service a line? That's a way to advice. get in. Yeah. Now, timing is everything. If the place is open, Sunday is the best day to call customers customer service, according mm -hmm. to TalkDesk. If not, start at 7 a.m. Anything before noon, TalkDesk says, uh, that you're going to get the 70% faster customer service. Get to somebody faster. Once you're on the phone, you yeah. finally get that human being on the phone, then what? What do you do? What so, do you Craig, you want to ask for their name, be polite, and ah. make sure they know you're taking notes. Okay, say that again. I'm just writing this all down. And what is the process for resolving my issue? Is there an email address I should specifically follow up with? Is there a contact or a callback number that you can give me? Mm -hmm. And if you get a number for a company, save it to your contacts yeah. on your mm -hmm. phone that reminds yeah. you, hey, this is a company I deal with a lot, and this is a way to get to a human being quickly. How about the online chat? Because you're seeing more of these chat bots, you know, on everybody's app. I know, and they're usually available 24-7, yeah. and you're like, I just want to call and talk to someone. No, if you have a simple question like, hey, my coupon code is not working, or do you have a promo code for me, or uh, what is the, you know, time that my product is going to run, go ahead and log on and do the chat. It's going to be a lot faster for those yeah. simple questions. It's not where you're going to get an empathetic yeah. ear or be able to tell your sob story, so know the limitations. But it gets you in line. Oh, absolutely. I did and it last night. your order number ready the yeah. dates, your receipt, all of that information. Type everything out clearly and chronologically. Don't put in a long novella right. okay. into that yeah. little yeah. chat box. Keep it and simple, Just stupid. know that AI is going to help us. You know what I think? What? Go Being ahead. kind. Yeah, always. you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. There was actually a study about that. I was just going to say, this has been a useful, informative seg segment. No one has enjoyed it more than the Gerber baby. I know. Maddie is a big fan of Consumer Confidential. I, I Thank you, baby. Oh, look, she's jumping she's up and down for us. She Maybe is it's so excited voice, about Consumer Confidential. Maddie had a head of hair. Hi, Maddie. Thanks for so joining. Cute. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Vicky. All right, coming up, there's some, as we just showed you, serious cuteness here in Studio <laughs> 1A. You are going to meet this year's Gerber baby. Isn't she precious? Yeah. And, and then look, more cuteness. he's also precious. He's so precious. Oh, look at Sean White. Hi, Sean White. Sean, Sean has a new Hello, project. Sean. He's going to take us back to his early days when he was also precious. He's just going to blow on his belly. He's we'll so cute. <laughs> we'll God. be right back. Blow on his belly? That's oh, a bit much. <laughs> to today every day we are adding to the star power in our studio the biggest names only on today see it worth coming in this early right hey, buddy, it's today. Hey, like i won the lottery how do you feel at this age this stage liberated we're just yeah. getting started folks ain't no stuff with us now. the boys are back in town the boys are back in town it's a miracle. It's a miracle. this has been fantastic everything and everyone you're talking about only on today 
So whether you're a parent or not, you we all have seen the iconic Gerber baby image. Began back in 1928. Today, we're exclusively revealing the 2023 Gerber baby. We love this tradition here. Following the company's photo search contest, Madison Reese Mendoza of Colorado got the big news from Gerber CEO. Madison is the next chief growing officer. Chief growing officer. I love that title. This year, Gerber also asked parents to send in their own throwback photos. So here, let's see this. You see mom, Dr. Crystal Mendoza, as a baby. And then... Do we have it back here? Yeah, it is. There we go. Wow. And then um, as baby, as a baby, and then Madison. They're here exclusively this morning along with dad, Dr. June Mendoza. Good morning to all of you guys. Good morning. Good so now that you've had a chance to let it sink in, what does it feel like? You have a Gerber baby. <laughs> So it's it's definitely been surreal. Feels like a dream. It felt like a one in a million shot. We yes, never thought she'd be. There are a lot of cute babies. <laughs> yeah, there are. Um, but we're just so grateful for this opportunity and excited for the world to meet Maddie. I love that. Well, Maddie's just adorable. Just absolutely. Congratulations, by the way, Maddie. Congrats to you. <laughs> Thank it was you. that adorable face and that winning personality. <laughs> Tell me about the throwback photos, uh, Crystal, that that you guys submitted. Well. I was 13 months in that one, uh -huh. and she was nine months it in that. It threw me off because yeah. I thought it was the same baby. Yeah, like, oh, my mom thought that was Madison, too. Wow. <laughs> and even the hairdo. I mean, wow. Yes. Yes. So, I, so, go ahead. Oh. Yeah. She wants to say oh, she's so, I mean, so well, it's, this girl has so much personality. Tell us a little bit about her. What's she like? Well, she loves baby music classes. Um, she looks very adventurous. Yeah, we, we um, take her to the local zoo. She loves feeding the giraffes. We've taken her paddle boarding. She loves to be on the water. And uh, we've hiked a couple times in and out of Colorado. And uh, I would say she's very adventurous in eating. So she's tried all the major food groups. She even tried <laughs> sea urchin once. She liked oh, that. Wow. So okay. yeah, very adventurous. Well, so here's what's pretty cool. She Because she's the chief growing officer, I was just looking here. She'll be featured in campaigns, of course, but there's also a cash prize, also a matching donation to support the March of Dimes because you serve uh, in the U.S. Air Force and Maddie, Maddie is a military child. And Gerber wanted to do something uh, more. Yeah. yeah. So they are donating $5,000 to Operation Homefront on behalf of oh. your family. Oh, that's great. Wow. That's amazing. I know. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and she loves it. She loves it too. Literally <laughs> jumping for joy. It too. <laughs> I, I just absolutely love it. Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. This is her first trip to New York City, I understand. It is. What has Maddie seen so far? <laughs> we toured Central Park. Okay. okay. Oh. That was fun for her. Wow. Well, Maddie, I hope you enjoy your time here in New York City, and congratulations. Congratulations, thank Maddie. You. Thank you so much. On your beautiful family. family. And thank, thank you for you. your service as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, to read more about this year's Gerber baby and see her winning photos, just go to today.com. The most well-behaved baby we I mean, have perhaps have ever had on this show. Uh, when we come back, the snowboarding goat himself, Sean White, live in studio to share something, something really cool. We're going to look back at his rise to Olympic stardom in a very unique way. Then a little bit later, have you uh, have you heard of a snackle box? No, what's Not yet. that? Well, you're going you're gonna to hear about it. We're going to show you how to make some outdoor memories. Oh, oh it's like a tackle box with That's snacks. Like, there you go. Oh, gosh, I like a good mashup. Today with Maddie right back after this. Our future co-host. <laughs>
This morning we have an Olympic icon and we like to thank a good friend of the show right yeah. here in Studio 1A, three-time gold medalist and snowboarding legend, Sean White. Since hey. retiring from the sport, he has been hard at work on a new docuseries on Max. It's called Sean White, The Last Run. And it goes from the glory days back to the early days when Sean was just a kid road tripping with his family. Mm -hmm. It was the only way to like kind of make it happen. It was the way to get us to the mountains and like save money. It was, like Aspen was not cheap. It's exactly what you can imagine. I mean, it was a family road trip. We were just going from mountain to mountain. We're getting on each other's nerves. You know, the heater goes out. We're freezing at night. It was it was amazing. Like it was just the best yeah. time. I'm, 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 Sean, good morning to you. Good oh, morning. Good morning. Yeah. I love a good sports doc. Mm. This is Thank a you. fantastic. I mean, sports doc. I'm almost through. It, it, and we just showed your parents here, your yeah. mom and your dad. There's, there's a fair amount of them throughout the doc. Of course. How yeah. crucial was that support early on from mom and dad? Well, it was amazing because snowboarding really wasn't anything at the time. Right. You know, it was a pretty rebellious sport. People didn't want snowboarders on the mountain. And my family's like, we're going to go full into this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they would drive, like you saw, you know, family road trips to the mountains. But we were really like the first suburban family to like take to snowboarding. Mm -hmm. And so it really kind of kept our family, you know, a close unit through childhood. You know what's interesting about this doc mm -hmm. series is that, you know, we all see the great moments, you know, when you are riding high. But what's great is this juxtaposes that mental and physical toll, yeah. you know, uh, in your life. Yeah, you know, there's just so much preparation that goes on in the background. And it's 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 one thing to strive to win something or to uh, accomplish a goal. But then you're sort of left with this, you know, what do I do next moment? And it's and and, and even if you you know reach that top, there's still this sort of feeling of like, well, what's next? And I pictured it a certain way. And how do I do it again? And the pressures and then the injuries. And so, yeah, there's a real behind the scenes of not only like my life, but the culture of the sport, because we both sort of came up together. Well, on that note, I was, it's interesting because in one of the episodes you talk about the fact that there really, there's no template for it. Like if you're making up a new trick or, yeah. you know, I feel like some of the younger guys now and girls, they can say, yeah. oh, remember when he did this? I'm going to try to do this. Yeah. You didn't have that. And there was no clear path. It's not like, well, you play in school and then you go college uh, and you get drafted. You yeah. know, it was like, all right, we hope this works out, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and especially with the tricks. Again, it's all inspiration. It's like you have to create a new trick to become the best. And um, there's this style component to it all. And then it's all just mental motivation. And then obviously the injuries to overcome. Yeah. Which so are, are you kind are of difficult. The, the template now or? I think, yeah, I think that's what's fun about this is it really shows that now there is a bit of a road that's been paved where you can actually become an Olympic you know, gold medal. Oh, you paved you know? yeah. yeah, That's right. You, 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 you so made the road. I'm, I'm I'll say it. You're, you're kind be, of the template. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the things that's also on display in this doc is is how hard it was for you to walk us walk away from a sport that you really helped to create. That's one mm -hmm. of the things. Last time we chatted out in Colorado, you were. You know, riding the re retirement wave a yeah, bit. You started yeah. White Space. Yeah, I just started the brand. How do you feel now being retired a few, you know, I guess a couple years in? I feel great. Um, especially having watched the documentary. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, that was, there's a lot of close <laughs> calls in there. I'm like, I made it out. Um, no, I, I feel great about the decision. And yeah, we were in the thick of it. I had, I had maybe told my parents, a few people yeah. before we talked. And so um, heavy decision, but I'm so thrilled. And life's been just incredible. So many things out there that I'm excited about. And, and like you mentioned, building the brand has been so cool because I'm still on the mountain. Mm -hmm. And now we're scouting that next, you know, talented young up and coming rider and, you know, helping their career. So it's been this really fun process to be on this side of the fence. Now. Yeah. And you've had so, time yeah. to, to post some great Social videos. You just posted yeah. one where you and your girlfriend, Nina Brett Dobrev, pretended to be each other. Oh, yeah. Uh, Wait, <laughs> she's got a movie coming out, oh, and yeah. my doc she's launched, and so here we are. Yeah. <laughs> so, so which one should people watch also, first? I, if I'm Nina today, you should watch Outlaws. <laughs> but I am Sean right now, so uh, you should definitely watch <laughs> The Last Run on Max. How's Nina doing, by the way? She's great. She's in, she's in town doing promo. Oh, yeah, cool. it's cool fun that, that we're both doing. Yeah. Oh, yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Always great. Yeah, yeah thank always you so much. Yeah. Thank you. By the way, that four-part documentary series, mm -hmm. Sean White, The Last Run, it is available to stream right now on Max. That's right. And All while right. Sean is always cool, we've got our series Cool for the Summer. How you can pull off the best outdoor party ever, from decorations to drinks, we got it all in the bag. We'll show you when the third hour of today comes right back. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back, here we go. Boom. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. And that's our Hoda. <laughs> happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. Back now with our series, Cool for Summer, July National Picnic Month. So we want to take the party outside, whether you want a casual lunch or something a little more elegant. Patrice J. Williams is an affordable lifestyle expert and author of Look and Fly on a Dime. Look and Fly on a Dime. Good time. morning, yeah. Patrice. It's good, good to see you. Welcome so you. so you've created these smash ups. So you got a snackle box, yes. you've got a bag that's also yes. a cooler, so that would make it a booler. Sure, if we okay. want to go with that name, um, but we can just call it a tote and a cooler. Okay. <laughs> All right, why not? It's a two in one a tote and cooler. Right, right. So from today until Saturday, uh -huh. viewers can actually get 20% off of this using mm -hmm. code Atlantic20. So you can use it for your essentials. And then there's a compartment that is insulated to so store cool. your food, store your drinks in here. So it really is that perfect two in one item that That's we love cute. so much. Yeah, yeah, tell me about these blankets. I okay. love these. Aren't they so soft? So it's super soft. The underside is also waterproof as well. It's personalized. So you can. Personalize so two of the lines. Cute. So we have your last names here. You can personalize a favorite saying, and it has four different games on it. So it's also interactive. I love Who's my kids love Shara? checkers. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> This is cute. You can take it with you. But, yes. so this is this also is dual portable. purpose. Yes, it does. It serves a dual purpose. So you've got the tote right here. Mm -hmm. Two cornhole tables come inside of this. So two tables, you get the eight bean bags, and this is easy to transport with you as well. So how much is this one? This is cute. This one is not too bad. It's not 80, 80, bucks. 80, 80, bucks. 80 bucks. Okay. You get the two tables, and you can also use this as an actual table as well. Oh, oh yeah. It holds up to 20 pounds. So okay, okay. let's get this is my favorite item today. The I think. snackle. The snackle wow. box. Okay, mm. so it's kind of what it sounds like snacks in a tackle That's box. Cute. <laughs> so because this literally is just a tackle box, you want to use the pre portioned sections. Have all your snacks in here. So you got your nuts, you so got cute. your fruits. But I also think this is great if you want like individual ones for each person, especially if someone has allergies. Oh, so everyone kind of yeah. gets their own boxes. Oh, and it just it. looks cute. It does look cute. You know, we love it the aesthetic. Makes it look yeah. like I do. It makes it <laughs> look like I'm doing something. Aesthetically right. pleasing. So you're going to up your picnic with, with a nice table. Right. Yes. Or like an outdoor setting. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have matching setting, which most people don't, this is table and teaspoon. They literally provide everything. So the plates, and like this is good quality stuff right mm -hmm. here as well. So the plates, the cups, Wait, the glasses. So Patrice, how does it work? Do you just... <laughs> You go online, you okay. order a specific set that you want. So this one here is the Harlow set. So you've got the leaf print motif. And they give you the they whole set? literally everything. That's everything you would ever need. The cutlery, the plates. They've got candlesticks, literally everything. And once you're done, you pack it up, 
ship it back. And you send it back. Send it back. You don't have to do the dishes. Oh. That is send everything oh, yeah. back. Down to the candles and everything? Well, these are the candles that come included with it in the okay. candlestick here. Yeah, these are You said you don't have to wash the dishes. No, you send it right back. They do that. That is a genius You're idea. You're busy doing other things. Wow. You don't have to wash the dishes? I know. That alone is enough to sell you That's on that really here. Just right. yeah. back moldy And then, of course, we have candles from Terrain. I know you are a huge fan. That's Look my at favorite store. I know you're a huge these fan. Are from these are citronella. Look how massive That's these are. That's a citronella candle. Yes, yeah, citronella. That's so it's going to repel cool. the bugs. This has up to 80 hours burn this time. This is wow. great. That's, That's actually, the biggest I, candle. I that is massive. Is great. <laughs> actually, no, I'm pretty sure I have this, this candle. See, now you do. That's, See? Oh, wait. Are these, is this plastic? It's acrylic, but acrylic. it's shatterproof. Shatterproof acrylic. Yes. So you get the wine bucket and four stemless glasses. How cute and you can is monogram that? these. So this is a perfect hostess gift. So the bucket and the glasses come monogrammed. Oh, it's got my right initials on it. Look at that's that. just yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Just you. Patrice, these are great. Thank you. And things that we haven't wow. seen. Exactly. I, I can't like. believe you can send all that stuff back. That's literally mean. send everything Please back. Please wash them. Blown. Wash that plate. Patrice J. Williams, it's always great having Thank you here. Thank you. Thanks so that was much. Great. If you like more information on these items, check out today.com slash shop. I'm going to throw a party. All right, yeah. coming up in Wellness Wednesday, if you've fallen into a summer slump, we're going to help you get out of it and get motivated again. We'll be right back. This Good morning. Welcome to today. What's shaking eggs and bacon? Hold what? on. I'm just going to say it. What? Badass. Oh, thank you. So do you think you'll act forever? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> We're going to have lots of fun yeah. this morning. Yeah. This morning in Wellness Wednesday, had a bus out of that summer slump. So if you're feeling unmotivated or unproductive, apparently it's not unusual this time of year. So we have Laura Vanderkam. She's here to help. She's a time management expert and author of Tranquility by Tuesday, oh. Nine Ways to Calm the Chaos and Make Time for what matters. Laura, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. So I have to tell you, full disclosure, I told her during the commercial break, I've never heard of a summer slump. I would think that in the summer, you're, if anything, more motivated. You have the vitamin D, you're outside. So what is the deal? Well, I could see that, but it turns out that the summer slump is real. Mm. There was a survey finding that productivity declines by 20% in the summer. You just don't want to work? Well, it's partly that. I mean, people are out on vacations yeah. and half your colleagues are gone. You're not getting stuff done. There's more distractions. And when the weather is nice, the opportunity cost of being at work just feels a little higher, <laughs> you know, and, and it, the same thing happens for the summer slump for people who are home with kids too yeah. in the summer. The boredom is setting in by this point, right? Yeah. How do we get through to fall? All right. So if we're feeling unfocused, if we're in the summer slump and we're feeling unfocused, you, you maintain that we should create what's called a priority list. Mm. So yeah. what, is, what is that and how does that work? Well, part of the reason that people waste time is that we don't know how we want to spend our time. Oh. So we need to figure that out. So I suggest everyone think about the upcoming week, you know, plan your life in weeks, make yourself a three category priority list, career, relationships, and self. What would be most important for you to accomplish in all these three categories? What would make for an awesome week if you got these done? You know, figure them out in each category, a work project, maybe lunch with and a that's friend. three yeah. things a week. That's three a things idea. a week. You can do this. This three is manageable. And it checks all the boxes. It checks all the boxes. Okay. So, so if we tend to procrastinate when we're doing this kind of thing. How do we set ourselves up for success as we, you, you move forward to try to avoid the slump? 
Yeah, well, one thing that leads to a slump is if we aim for too much mm -hmm. and we don't get it done and then we feel frustrated, right? So you want to aim small. If half your colleagues are out, you are not going to get through a project as quickly as if they're all there. Right. Um, we want to make manageable to-do lists. There is no virtue in putting something on a to-do list and then not doing it. Right. Like it's just as not like done. Like you already know it's not gonna yeah, be done. It's, it's not just happen. as not done as if you never decided to do it yeah, in the first place, yeah. only now you feel bad about it. So we didn't win there. So many times we'll use our downtime. I know I'm guilty. And you should I, avoid multitasking. Oh. oh yeah, well, you know, we think that we're getting more done. If yeah. we're doing two things, that, you're generally not. No, no exactly. Yeah. You're doing Focus. two things not really well. Two things badly. Focus on one thing, get it done. You will feel so much more accomplished. That's funny. On that note, I was saying, sometimes when you have downtime, you find yourself scrolling or at least I do. Let's say it's Instagram or whatever. Doom scrolling. And it just ends up <laughs> sucking all your time and you're not getting anything done. Yeah, and another thing that leads to the summer slump is this feeling like your leisure time is not that exciting, yeah, right? I love this effortful, not effortless. What do you effortful mean Effortful before effortless. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with effortless fun. We like to watch Netflix. We like to scroll around on our phone. But there's all kinds of other fun that people say they would love to have if only they had the time, right? Things like reading or hobbies yes. or connecting with friends. So challenge yourself when you've got a little bit of free time to do one of these forms of effortful fun for just a few minutes before you switch to the other thing. So read a book for 20 minutes, then you can watch Netflix or, you know, call a friend and then you can scroll around on your phone as much as you want, but you'll feel a lot more satisfied with your leisure time. Use bits of time for bits of joy. Absolutely. If you've got a little spot of time during the day, five minutes while you're waiting for a phone call to start, you could look at Instagram, but you could also read an ebook. Maybe it's not a beach read yeah. if you're not at the beach, but it could be. Play with the kids. <laughs> Play with the kids would be a great this, idea as well. Your last recommendation, I think, is, is probably the best one, and we're all guilty of not doing enough of this, at least from time to time. Recharge. Absolutely. Just recharge. We aren't machines. We have to recharge. And if we are not feeling productive, maybe we need to do something to boost our energy levels. Mm -hmm. And so lots of things you can do. Obviously, take a real vacation. Yeah. Use your vacation days. But even if a big trip isn't in the cards for you right now, you can have little mini vacations, little bits of you know, adventure that a you plan into weekend. your life. Mm -hmm. A long weekend, or even just something that takes less than an hour, uh -huh. as long as you are genuinely looking forward to it. You know, try that new ice cream place. And Go do for a walk somewhere for yourself. Pretty. Do you something know, for yourself. As far as eating you will, well and exercising. Eating well and exercising, you will feel a lot better. I love that. Laura, mm. thank you so much. This is great. I know. Thank well, you. this Wednesday. <laughs> we'll be right back. Morning, everybody. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Oh, you deserve to be celebrated. Way to go, Reynolds. Oh, Al. Al, you're all of our heroes. Y'all yeah. love Al Roker. Tomorrow on the third hour of today, solutions to some common summer beauty problems. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna from the new movie, They Clone Tyrone. <laughs> Golden Globe winner, John Boyega. We hope you have a great day today and hope to see you back here tomorrow. Okay, Enjoy, day. everybody. Bye-bye.
from the new movie, They Clone Tyrone. We've got Golden Globe winner John Boyega. Then from Oprah to Naomi Watts and Gwyneth Paltrow, why women are talking about menopause. Maria Shriver has what you need to know. And my awesome night with Shania Twain. I hit the stage with the music superstar in a jam-packed Madison Square Garden for a night I'll never forget. It's, okay. it's today with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. So Hi, it's a Wednesday. It is July the 12th. We're so happy that you are here with us today. Sure are. You know one of the things I love about Hoda? What? Is there's just trash. <laughs> Wait, those were pretzels about two when seconds ago. Them? I, I didn't just even know Just on the way. Just on the way. Um, how are you? I'm you good. had the wildest coolest night it, ever it really was like i i woke up you know when the very first thing you think about when you open your eyes whatever that thing is was the night before it was the night before it was um shania twain is in concert now keep in mind she is the like the number she has the number one selling country album ever yes the number she's the highest grossing like female she sold more albums than any other woman um but she sold the garden out in five seconds we all love her songs. Yes. Whose bed have your boots been under? I know. Man, I feel like. Whose beds have your boots been under? Okay. Um, <laughs> you're still the one, all the songs. So she said, I did an interview with her. I was just going to the garden. And she said, why don't you come up and, um, and sing? I was like, have you heard me? <laughs> she goes, but let's just do it. We haven't, we haven't done that. We haven't done that before. Oof. And so... Um, I said, okay. Can we please watch it? Still the one I want Still the one that I The only one I dream Still the one I kiss Good night Hoda is one of the most I've ever, ever met. Um, so this is like a, that was a very cherished moment, Hoda. Thank you so much. Okay, <laughs> I don't know what about that. When I watched it the first time, when it was on earlier, I was kind of tearing up because there was something about it that was so special. By the way, you know what the thing about her is, which I knew she was an awesome human, yeah. but before the before we went out, she was like, I want to make sure you're dressed. I'm going to help you get dressed. So she gave me that shirt of hers, and it was 15 minutes till she was supposed to step out on stage. It was 8.15. She goes, okay, this isn't right. Hoda needs a different necklace. She literally was putting things on me. <laughs> And she had a towel around her hair, her head, her body. Yeah. Yeah. Her hair was up. She wasn't ready, but she didn't care. She was taking. She the was time. taking care of me, and she said she asked the stage hand, "Can you show her the steps? No, be careful of that last step. You're going to be fine." She's like, like a loving oh, human she was being. So generous. I was so like, um, yeah. I was just so blown away. I mean, I know she's an incredible performer and a singer and a yeah. nice, great person, but she's more than all that. Wait, combined. now she wanted you to wear some like little trunks. <laughs> she wanted yeah. you to wear some underwear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she was like, you don't need to wear pants because I don't. You just wear these. They're trunks. And Wait, I, thought, I wish we had a picture. Well, I thought trunks meant like a, like, you know. Shorts. Yeah. What did they mean? They meant like, okay, you know your bathing suit bottom? Yes. That. Trunks. That's what they were. She goes, it's fine. No one's going to know. I go, no, I can't do it. She was, I was scared of her a little bit. Because it's like. You well, you know why? Yeah. Because she tells you this is what you're doing and you kind of understand why she's well, in charge. you feel like you sort of have to. I almost did. Wait, why did we not have the picture of, of Hoda and the trunks? That's okay. That's all right. I want to okay. see you in those little booty no, shorts. No, you don't. No, you don't. Okay. So let's, get, by the way, from one country, incredible country music yeah. star. By the way, see her in concert. Yes. She's so much fun. Yes. Blast. Okay. Okay. Now we're talking about mm -hmm. another. Their team, a duo, Dan and Shay, yes. are making some headlines. Yeah, they actually released a little video, and it talked about their almost split Whoa. in 2021. They almost split. Take a look. I was in, like, the lowest low of my entire life. Came off the road, and I was like, man, I've, I've 
hate music. I I'm ready to quit. No, I could I could feel the separation, and I think there was there was little things between you and I that we never talked about. Anyway, it was affecting everything. You live life, things happen, life gets in the way. Yeah. And I had no balance before. It was completely one-sided. I was ignoring my marriage. I was ignoring all my friends. That I completely burnt myself out. Entirely burnt myself out. That was a real grown-up conversation to have. It was. And, it, like, those kind of meaningful conversations You know, it's so never interesting, because I feel like what he said... I can't remember which one's Dan or Shay. I feel bad. Okay, okay. Do you? Not right now. Okay, but it's okay. <laughs> well, sh- well, well I think Shay had the long, long hair. hair. It was easier. I know, but he got a cut. Yes. Okay, but anyway, when, the, when one said there were a lot of things that we weren't talking about, mm-hmm. it's like those silent killers... It's when you're not communicating. Okay, think about how many times you and Henry text or communicate during the course of a single day. Yeah. All those little micro, little tiny communications add up at the end. And if you don't, and I've been in relationships where I just didn't, you know, I figure when we'll see each other and then we'll catch up. But there is something about all the things that you miss during the course of the day. But I liked what he said about, like, Sometimes a little thing you don't talk about, and then yes. it, then it's another little thing, yes. and then another, and pretty soon all those little things have become a big thing. You're buried, but you're like, and you don't address it because it's sometimes it's easier to sweep it under the yes. rug, talk about it tomorrow, yes. not a big deal. We'll do it's it another so, time. So I feel like both of us were, you know, and I don't mean this about my parents, but I was raised in a way where like non-confrontational. I didn't yes. grow up in a yelling household. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. I wasn't going to disrespect my right, parents right. because there were repercussions. Right, right, right. But, right. you know, it's so, it's it's harder to tell the truth. Yes. It's harder to have those conversations. Yes. Haven't you had some yes. where you feel shaky? Yes. But once you do it, yeah. you're free. It's such a relief. And if you've ever been, and we've all been in the world, like, you're, should, I t- should I have the conversation? You'll say, no, it's not the right time. Not tonight. Maybe in the morning. He's yeah. tired. She's tired. Have it. Yes. Have it. Yeah. You'll feel better. Yes. No matter what happens, you'll feel better. And I feel, feel like better. in our duo ship, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. is that a word? Yeah. You know, if we didn't have some of these conversations, yeah. I mean, first of all, we talk about everything. Yeah, we do. Off camera, that's yes. all we're doing is yeah. we're talking. Yeah. But if there is something that bothered one of us, yeah. there's such a safe space to discuss it. Without question. Without question. Aren't we lucky? Yeah, we are. All <laughs> okay. right, coming up next, we're going to weigh in on your social dilemmas. And we're doing it with a very oh, yes, special surprise are. guest. Uh-huh. I can see them in my don't eyesight, sh- but it's don't a surprise. show her. <laughs> surprise. Right after this. dole out some words of wisdom to our viewers. It's a segment we like to call Oda and Jenna's Social Dilemmas. Okay, and since there is someone that we both always go to. Always. She's our guru. We've said it before. We'll say it again. We decided to bring in our good friend, Maria Schreiber. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, so just be before here. we get to the social dilemmas, people love when Maria comes because she's like a problem solver. She'll no, sit in the I'm make- not. Yes, you, you are. are. Okay. You sat you in the makeup you room. Are. You sat in the makeup room, <laughs> and one by one, there's like a line. First, Chanel's in line, and then Craig's in line. <laughs> I think I was first. And you were first. Jenna <laughs> was, was in line. I'm always in line. Okay, yes. should we get to okay. our first dilemma? Okay, yeah. All right, here's the first one. 
My mother-in-law is a big help with the kids, but she's constantly zinging me over my parenting style. How do I let her know I appreciate her help, but I would appreciate her laying off the comments, too. So you're a mother-in-law. Yeah, I'm a mother-in-law. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so what do you do? So I zip my mouth. Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah, I zip my mouth. What if I don't want that problem. No. Okay, but what if you're like... The kid's not behaving or is saying rude things and nobody's correcting. They're like, isn't she cute? What yeah. would you say anything or? I, I no. try to really zip my zip mouth. It. Yeah, I try to really. Well, of course, it's different when the daughter is yours yes. versus yeah, the yeah, son, yeah. Yeah. Right? right? Well, it's hard for this person, yes. too, because it sounds like she's helpful. Yeah. Yeah, so she's helpful. I, I hear that quite do? a bit yeah. in the baby group that yeah. I'm in, which is with all the young mothers. So yeah. I hear a lot of mother in law talk, yeah. which is why I try to zip it. But um, I think it's always best to like, gosh, I, I love that you're such a great help. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. All the praise. And you know, it sometimes hurts my feelings yeah. when you criticize, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm still learning. Uh, I'm right. still learning. I'm still trying to figure it out. And I'd really love your support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Did, perfect. Was your yeah, mom, was your mom like critical of your parenting or was? No, no, I don't think she weighed in on that. No. She just weighed in on like, let's move it along. <laughs> like, let's go, let's, let's go, go, let's go. go. Let's go. That might be us. Yeah. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. Keep your whole life moving. That's yeah. it. Okay. That I think that's she... perfect advice. Yeah, that and is. And you know what? Have her, have the son say something too. Yeah. Have your husband be like, hey, mom. Yeah, that's always. A, but right? you see her these stories of oftentimes when the husband does say something that I've heard that she's, then there's estrangement. Because so he's I've choosing, yeah. right? He's so chosen the mother. Well, oh yeah, no, you're you choosing to, the wife. I know, but but that's what you do. You oh, choose the wife. I know, but you you can't. They have to get along. The, yes. the wife and the mother along. have to get along. Okay, okay everybody has to get has along. To get along. To. Please. <laughs> All right, here's the next one. I'm the oldest of three siblings. Our parents are in their 80s, and I live closest to them. I'm constantly checking in, running mm -hmm. the errands, and I'm the emergency person. Yet my youngest sister is constantly getting oh. all the praise. Uh-oh. How do I get my parents to realize uh, I'm the one they should be thinking? Okay. That's old. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That's really old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so, like a childhood thing? That's a childhood is thing, that? right. So go to therapy? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's always. I mean, I've, I've, yeah. Every, all of us have been in that situation. I think if you have siblings, if you have older parents, I think maybe talking to your siblings. I found that really helpful when both of my parents were aging. All the siblings spoke they got to one another. We got yeah. together and tried to keep my parents uh, separate from it. So if your mother had been praising you more than the, yeah. your brothers. Parents do that. They just do yeah. that. They do it on whatever it is, yeah. right? I think it's, they're in their own groove, right? Yeah. So, so don't mess with them. You guys just work it out amongst the, is the siblings. that Dan, Don Miguel Ruiz always says with the four agreements, don't take it personally. Yeah, definitely. You yeah. just have to keep coming back to yeah. why you're taking personally. care of them, what yeah. you're giving them, and know yeah. you're giving them a lot. Hard to do. Okay. Can we get to the last one? I have a female friend who is everything I want in a woman. She is smart. She's funny. She's, she's kind. We've talked about dating, but she says she doesn't want to mess up our great friendship. But I still get mixed signals. How can I convince her to give us a shot? <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't know. <laughs> well, I just don't know how to answer that one. I suppose date me. Yeah. 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 Try, date yeah. me and see date how it goes. I'll I don't still want to wreck the friendship. After. But sometimes it does yeah, wreck it does a friendship. Yeah, it does wreck a friendship, yeah. Sometimes that can. You does. have to decide. Sometimes you, maybe you value the friendship more and say, you know, I'm sorry, but. Or maybe the I value the friendship is a reason not to date. Do it. Maybe yeah. the person saying something that way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, maybe they're saying I'm not that into you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So All can right, you fix me is... and Jenna? Do you have any more extra time? I have that. <laughs> I, you I, I felt like today with the blow dryer, I couldn't get the, the guru knowledge I, know, I need. We were like, yeah, the tomorrow. makeup room is our special I safe haven where tomorrow. everybody comes in. I'm going to yeah. come in early. Don't come hair. in on my time. No, no, I'm not going to come okay. in on your time. Okay, I'm going to come okay. in and get my hair done so that my ears are Okay, can go okay, cool, cool. All right, if you've got a social dilemma, tell us all about it at hodaandjenna.com. All you have to do is hit the connect button. All right, so Marie's going to stick around to tell her why Oprah, Gwyneth, Naomi, and more are all talking about menopause. It's a topic on a lot of people's minds. We'll talk about it right after this. <laughs>
we are back with our good friend Maria Shriver, and we are talking menopause. Yeah, far too often women are reluctant to talk about it, but that's mm -hmm. beginning to change. Yeah, yeah it is. It's a natural life process. That's what we have to say. So we should all be speaking more openly about how it's impacting women and our health. It's something I've been doing for quite some time, most recently alongside Oprah on her menopause talk. Fortunately, we're not the only ones talking about it, and we hope you'll join in the conversation. The menopause train is coming no matter what. Every year, millions of women in the United States go through menopause. Once thought to be a taboo conversation, celebrities like Oprah, Naomi Watts, Drew Barrymore, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Viola Davis are speaking up in hopes to normalize this natural part of womanhood. I can feel the hormonal shifts happening, the sweating, the moods, you know, you're just like all of a sudden furious for no reason. Even former First Lady Michelle Obama opened up about hot flashes on her podcast. I remember having one on Marine One, I'm dressed, I need to get out, walk into an event, and literally, it was like somebody put a furnace in my core. A woman is considered in menopause when she goes 12 months without having a period, but the symptoms can be present for as long as a decade. When I learned that it was a potential 10-year window, uh, that really changed everything for me. Now the conversation is even shifting to the workplace where some companies are adopting support programs for women going through menopause. What is menopause? Menopause is hell. <laughs> it is. Jimmy. All jokes aside, knowledge is power. And the more we speak up, the more we can help one another. Our mothers didn't have these conversations with us because their mothers didn't. Yeah. And they, the, the cycle was just passed on and the tide is changing. Joining us alongside Maria is Dr. Barry Ridgway, the chief of staff at the Cleveland Clinic. It's so great to have both of you here. Maria, I, it's interesting that this is the time that there's like a big spotlight that's being shown down on menopause. Why do you think that is and why does this conversation need to happen now? Well, I think it's exciting. Yeah. I think it's exciting and we have to include perimenopause yeah. in the whole menopause yeah. umbrella. And I think because a lot of women are questioning their health, where there's much more of a focus on women's yeah. health. And then there are women who are looking at this as a business. They're going in and saying, wow, there is nothing out there for me. Maybe this is a good yeah. business for me. So women are entrepreneurial. There are more women doctors who are mm -hmm. opening up, talking about that. As I always say, that my kids say, you had a male gynecologist, you had a male. <laughs> yeah. Like I like, there weren't any women there yeah. to yeah. deliver you. You know, so I think more women entering the medical field, more women who are entrepreneurial, more women who are like, I don't like the way I feel, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to speak about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Ridgeway, Maria and I had a really good conversation mm -hmm. this morning about women's health in general. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, when you're having babies, there's a lot of focus, and then obviously if there's something wrong, mm -hmm. you tackle it. But what should we be doing in this midlife? Where should we be going? What type mm -hmm. of doctor should we be going to? What kind of questions should we be asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's a great question, and midlife is a perfect time to reset and say, how do I want to age? Do I want to age into health, mm. or do I want to age into illness? That's good. And when deciding to age into health, one of the first things is to partner with a primary care physician. This is someone who will again be a partner with you to talk about how you want to live, what chronic conditions, how you can decrease risks, and to know you personally so when there is something right or wrong, that they can work with you to feel your best and age into health. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, when they don't feel well, they look for a drug or something to help yeah. them feel better. And that's the way it's like tackle the problem. But Maria, you're talking about kind of big picture and looking at overall health, like preventing Holistic. it. Yeah, yeah and yes, Exactly. I mean, I think that if people are living longer, yeah. right? So I think people focusing, as Dr. Ridgway said, in their 40s, who do I want to be yeah. at 65? Yeah. Who do yeah. I want to be at 80? Yeah. Do I want to have balance? Do I want to prevent as many illnesses as I can? Do I want to know what I'm susceptible to? Do I want to know what happened with my mother? Yeah. What's in my family? Mm -hmm. So I think these are questions, and hopefully now as we begin to shed light on women at mid-age, on osteoporosis, if we talk about perimenopause, so when women hear, oh, I didn't know that depression and anxiety is associated mm -hmm. with menopause, maybe I don't have to go on an SSRI, or maybe I go on an SSRI, 
or hormones. Mm -hmm. And there's been a whole shift, I would say, huge shift in terms of when we talk about hormones and menopause and p perimenopause mm -hmm. out of the Women's Health Initiative. So my generation was told, don't touch a hormone. Mm -hmm. Now women who are coming into perimenopause and menopause are spoken about a window yeah. that you can and should take hormones if they're good for you, right? And they're spoken about all of these other aspects of their health. So I think this is an exciting moment mm -hmm. in, in women's health, exciting moment to be entering perimenopause. And doctors like Dr. Ridgway are saying at big hospital systems like the Cleveland Clinic, hey, we need to focus on women, mm -hmm. particularly women in their 40s, 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. and beyond. Yeah. Um, Dr. Ridgway, what are some symptoms that we can look for in both pre, pre and menopause, although I didn't say that per, right, perimenopause, per yeah. yeah. and the menopause. transition yeah. to menopause? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the uh, hallmarks is irregular periods, uh -huh. irregular bleeding, as you start to spread out or skip periods. Then the next most common are these hot flashes, yeah. hot flushes, vasomotor symptoms. This is where we saw in the video that just furnace almost that you feel. And this happens in about 80% of women. Mm. So it's extremely common. Beyond that, we look at um, sleep disturbances, night sweats, yeah. Yeah. mood changes, including depression. Do you, right. do you need to get a diagnosis for this? Like, are you diagnosed with menopause? Or can, you, if you have those symptoms, is that just the way if it is? If you're between 45 and 55 yeah. and you have those classic hallmark symptoms, you, you don't need a formal diagnosis. Yeah. You don't need a blood test to yeah. confirm that. And in fact, in that transition time, those blood tests can be misleading. Oh. Now, if you're under 45 and especially under 40, yeah. I would definitely uh, want to confirm that because it's a little bit of a different risk profile in that sure. group of people. But if there are irregular symptoms that can happen in menopause, say heart palpitations or other mm -hmm. things, this is, again, partnering with your doctor because we don't want to rely just on you're 50 and you are right. likely in perimenopause or postmenopausal. Mm -hmm. We want to say, what's wrong with you? Let's rule those things out before yeah. we we go on and treat just for menopause. Mm -hmm. and, and Maria, just to end, are, are we doing enough for women's no. health in this country? <laughs> no, we're not researching women's uh, health spans enough. We're not funding research into how women age enough. We don't understand why women are two thirds of those who get Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. the majority of those who get MS, the majority of those with autoimmune. We don't know and we need a federal commitment. We need mm -hmm. hospitals to commit. We need doctors to research and study. Mm -hmm. Most doctors who are my age, will say, I had an hour on menopause. Yeah. I didn't even study Jeez. Alzheimer's. Yeah. So wow. you're meeting them in the office and they'll be like, you know, I want to do my best, but we I weren't taught know. about this. Yeah. So right. my hope is that when you get to the doctor's mm -hmm. office at my age, you're met with very different answers. Mm -hmm. And I know you will be because we're going to get more federal funding and focus on women's health, as I said, particularly at midlife. Yeah. Women deserve to be seen. They deserve to be heard. They deserve to be cared for. And millions don't feel that way. Mm. Well, I know we will be because you're... <laughs> I know, I was going to say. <laughs> can't stop you. Yeah. All right. We definitely uh, will be. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thanks, <laughs> yeah. Maria. All right, coming up next, a movie to put on your summer watch list. Okay, it's called They Cloned Tyrone, and we've got one of the big stars, Golden Globe winner John Boyega, right after this.
All right, get your popcorn ready. There is a new Netflix movie that's expected to be a huge summer thriller. It's called They Cloned Tyrone. Yeah, and one of the stars is John Boyega, who shook up Hollywood with roles in the latest Star Wars trilogy, The Woman King, and his Golden Globe winning performance in Small Acts. John, we're such fans of yours. Good we're morning. We're so happy hey, yeah. to see you. First of all, you're, you're, you're a fashion plate. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, thank you. Do you thank pick you. your own outfit? or did No, I've got an incredible stylist that, Avo, that I collaborate with, and we just decided to show out, you know? Were you all, did, were you always interested in, like, this is not, yeah. we couldn't dress like this no, if somebody it, dressed us. Nah, nah, I'm sure you can, you got it in you. But this, <laughs> is, this, is, this has always been a part of my expression to where, you know, the threads that, you know, express me. Yeah, well, you're really, uh, well, they cloned Tyrone. This yeah. is very trippy, kind of a complex yeah. uh, characterization. You play three versions of the same person. Mm -hmm. How how was that for you as an actor to sort oh, that out in your head? I feel like that's an incredible opportunity. Such such versatility and as an actor you get excited because you get to show the world, you know, the differences in your range as mm -hmm. well. So, you know, shout out to Joel Taylor for, for giving me the scripts and giving me the opportunity, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Okay, yeah. so you star alongside Jamie Foxx. Yeah. We heard it was always your dream <laughs> to star with him. Oh, How, yeah. You must have been pinching yourself. I'm pinching myself. And that's that's crazy. The first time we met each other was at D23. Um, he was promoting, I think, an animated movie done for Pixar, and I was promoting Star Wars. And he said, yeah, baby, we're going to work one day, man. We're going to work. He uh, said you know, that? Yeah, he said that to me. And uh, manifestation, you know, from yes, his words. seriously. Down the line, it, it happens. But that's Jamie. He's a big supporter of the young actors coming up behind him as well. So that's why we love him so much. Well, we've been missing yeah. Jamie. Obviously, a lot of yeah. people have. He's had some medical issues, and it's kind of unclear what it is. Have you been able yeah. to talk to him? Is he okay? I mean, we've just been giving him his privacy, but he's, he's, all, he's all good, and we're just waiting for him to come back in his own time, mm -hmm. you know? Just yeah. giving him that privacy. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful guy. Okay, mm -hmm. so you, you you did something kind of interesting. Yeah. You're, you're 30, right? Yeah, 31 now. 31, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. So, and you took a break. Yeah. What, what what was that for, and did it sort of help you refocus, like, what you want to do? Oh, for sure. I mean, I, I mean, we all came off of that kind of forced break with the, the COVID and, and oh, pandemic. Totally. But that wasn't kind of planned. But this planned break was more for wellness, to get my mind right, um, to spend more time with mum, you uh -huh. know, and just to catch up on the other sides of my life that I probably would have neglected with a busy schedule, you know? That's very mature. And it also, I feel like, is unusual for a young actor because <laughs> usually they're like, yeah, strike while the iron's hot. You got to get yeah, it, got to get it, get it. Were you scared when you tapped the brakes that sometimes when people tap the brakes, they wonder if they come back, will there be opportunities oh, for there? Oh, for sure, for sure. But the, it, it affects the way you work. So I decided to kind of work three projects back to back, which was The Woman King, Breaking, and Tyrone. And then just kind of like give that stop. time to stop and then give that time for, for a break, knowing that you've got projects, you know, yeah. coming what out. What does your mom, by the way, you said your mom, mm -hmm. to spend time with her. What? Tell yeah. me what she thinks about your incredible career. Oh, she's she's <laughs> really proud. She was at the premiere for They Clone Tyrone the other day. And she actually said, you know, I've never told you this, but um, I like you as an actor. I like, like you're you actually one actor. of like like a f my favorite actors, you know, whether or not I gave birth to you. And she kind of held her stomach and said, I can't believe you came from me. Oh. Not for me, you know. You know you're doing something right. Wow, you know? that yeah. that's such a powerful thing. It's a thing. powerful thing. It, it it really reinforces your whole entire existence. You know. What Did I mean? they? So. Were, was she supportive all along when you yeah. when you were young and you were like, this is my dream? Yeah. And I do I mean, my parents are Nigerian, and, yeah. and they let me um, drop out of university to come out to LA to, to just hustle for wait, the wait, dream. Wait, wait, how did that conversation go? Yeah. That could not have been easy. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't an easy conversation. <laughs> Thankful, thankfully, I had my agent Femi at the time that helped me kind of like you know break yeah. the ice on that. But we. Yeah. Just had to say, look, okay, he's going to be staying in some motel off of Hollywood Boulevard and going for these auditions in a place that he doesn't know. But there's something in there. There's something did, we're able to Did your to parents watch. say, okay, you can try that? But yeah, when my, you're done trying that, you're going to go back to university. Well, my, my dad was more so just like, you know, you've, you've got a year, you know, you've, you've got One a year. year. Did that yeah. help sort yeah. of give you this timeline to kind of put, you know, light yeah. fire? It did. It did. Um, and now he would say, I was only joking. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but he, he was just like, you've got this set amount of time and, and do your best with it. Because if, if it feel, feels too elongated, there might be a distraction, well, you know. Well, we looked way back into our archives. We sure did. And we found your first on-camera appearance. It was a cool ad for puberty. Anyway. <laughs>
you are. You, post, you posted it. To be honest. of puberty. There you are. Oh, my God. Smiling and okay, grinning. Wait, the way those have been circulating is hilarious. I think that's at every college, every university. Yeah. That's why they wind now, up. Can we ask how, how that came about? Did somebody just say, hey, you want to be in an ad for puberty? No. At the time when I was first starting out as an actor, I went online and just put free auditions, free opportunities. Um, and there was just this university that said they had a stock shoot um, going on in, a, in some random university. University in East London, and it was fifty pounds. Yeah, you know, which for me at the time was just like, all right, you know, fifty pounds, <laughs> <down, laughs> fifty pounds for a nine-hour day. <laughs> but, uh, we just came in, took the pictures, and then now I see myself on random flyers in institutions. <laughs> <laughs> oh my well, gosh, you're such a lovely, John, lovely person. No, thank you so back. much. Thank you for being here, I and this is such it. a fun, mm -hmm. fun film. Yeah. They you, cloned Tyrone. We'll be on Netflix July 21st. Check it out. Thank you. Thanks, John. Coming up next, a light summer dish from celebrity chef Antonia LaFaso coming up after this. season for sweet summer corn. So head out to your local supermarket or farm stand because we have the perfect dish for you. Food Network star Antonia LaFaso dropped by to show us how to make her favorite summer staple. You're talking about corn yes. ravioli. You're talking about homemade ravioli. Yes, we this are. This is fancy. We are talking about all things corn right okay. now. Obviously, it's summer. Oh, we've got corn popping over there. Should I'm I turn it down? Lower. Yeah, could you run over yeah, there yeah. and just mm -hmm. make it lower real quick? Mm -hmm. um, that's actually when we see popcorn, is this right? Yeah, yeah, totally. that's perfect. Is it just like that. into popcorn? Uh, it's, no, it's just popping, hence the term popcorn. Yeah. Okay. okay, so we're celebrating corn, we've got a little bit of flour, we've got egg yolks, we've got salt. So we're actually making we're the ravioli. We're actually making the ravioli. So you've got some mm -hmm. olive oil, mm -hmm. a little bit of water, mm -hmm. and what you see right there, okay, we're going to let that go. It's it pasta. turns right oh, into that, that pasta dough. Look how cute. It's well, it's a, it's a half order right now. Okay. Take it, we'll turn that off. Okay. Just kind of give it like a little bit of a knead. It rests for like a good hour, okay. up to 24 Outside. hours in the refrigerator. In the you refrigerator. want it covered in the refrigerator. Then you have like this attached that would go right what here. So it's a pasta sheet. Oh. So you would put it on there and it actually sheets out. And as we move over there, you'll see it. Oh, but sheet. fresh dough, if you really think about it, it's eggs, flour, water, salt, so olive it's oil. It's not so hard that we it's, can't be trying. Exactly. And then over here, we've got a little bit of butter that's browning, mm -hmm. okay? And I like to call this almost like a fresh corn pudding, right? right? Yeah. What so are you doing? I'm grating, grating corn. If you want to actually try yeah. it, go careful, for it. Careful, careful. Yeah, watch your fingers on it. But essentially, you're going to grate corn and it turns into this kind of beautiful beautiful corn puree, yeah, if you will. Yeah, that looks beautiful. Now, as the summer goes, right, the summer corn, very, very sweet to start, and then it gets a little bit starchier mm -hmm. as the season goes out. I actually like when the corn gets starchy starchier. because it turns into... What, what do you mean starchier? So, starchier mean? as in, like, thicker, like, there's oh. more starch to the corn versus, like, last week. Look, it's, so it's just like that mush. Right yeah. that. Now, you can leave this, like, butter, salt, sugar, and actually, like, put it with fish, and it's actually, like, you know, a Ooh, beautiful... Like a underneath the fish? Under like a fresh corn polenta. It's Wait, polenta. what? Yeah. Okay. That's so easy. Yes. So then you have the corn pudding there, a little bit of mascarpone, and a little bit Wait, of Wait, so what, you don't add anything okay. to the corn to make so it like that? So you let it pudding? just cook down, you let okay. it reduce, and yeah. you let it get nice have about one minute. Okay, okay. Let's go. Sure. Ready? Wait, so. what do you, oh, you, so you 
it. Now it. we're making the, the ravioli. ravioli. Now, is this just, just like, like an that. ice tray? What is this? It looks, I actually like to call it like an egg beater, if you will, right? Like with the things that you would put your um, so you, deviled eggs on. Yeah. So you just take this top layer. Is this how you made it? Yeah, right on top. top. Go ahead, throw it and on top there. It. Okay. And well, then you, you actually it? use a rolling pin. What? Okay. Yep, and I threw the raviolis in there. They're going to take about a okay. minute to cook. Okay. This just goes right over the top, and you press, press. Oh, oh, look. Until it yeah. look. Yep, you see the puncture come yeah. out yeah. the top. Okay. You flip and then it. You, then you flip them flip and they it. pop out. Right. Okay. Oh, my got gosh. It. Now we've okay. got corn in here because, again, celebrating corn, a little bit of butter, oh, a mm. little bit of stock. Mm. Oh, thank you. You finish it right in there. That's it? That's it. It's and chicken you, stock, it's butter, it's corn, it's raviolis, and it's Parmesan cheese. Is it crazy, Jim? I like to finish mm. with a little bit of mm. Parmesan cheese inside That's of the pot. So delicious. Love it. Really good. It's summer ravioli, yeah. like, mm. celebration mm. on a plate. And I'm it's more, so simple. Like, you can go, like, a little bit of, like, herb if you want to. But I really feel like just I the love cheese, it. just the corn, just the ravioli. Okay, wait. Done. You're also hosting Food Network's Beachside Bra. Yes. What, what can we expect? So you can expect a lot of things in the sand. You can expect <sighs> fishing on a boat. You can expect big, like, fires in the sand as you're, like, roasting large meats. Of fun. course, all I of your it. favorite people. Where was this? Yeah. Yeah. Where was that? So this was actually an... an in uh, Los mm -hmm. Angeles. Oh my God, yeah. fun. So cool. it's East Coast versus West Coast. We did shoot in LA, but you know, we, yeah. we're celebrating both coasts. Awesome. We get the recipe today.com slash food, and you can catch new episodes of Beachside Brawl Sunday nights on the Food Network. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Coming up next, the so mother good. and daughter making history and country music. And don't miss the Here. national TV debut of One the D Duo right after this. Uh -huh. <laughs> The City Music Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. I forgot. <laughs> They're the mother-daughter duo that is taking the country music world by storm. We're talking about Takitha and Prana Supreme, better known as One the Duo. One the Duo, what a brilliant name. They are getting ready to drop their debut album. It's oh. called Blood Harmony. By the way, Jen and I are so envious of this duo, <laughs> a mother-daughter. Whose idea was it to it make was, this happen? It was my idea. And you it just wanted idea. to sing with your mama? Oh, absolutely. I was 14 when I first brought the idea up to her. And so I'm 22 now. So if you can imagine, I was thrilled and over the moon when she finally said yes. Well, she... you did good, Mom. I know. Thank you. You did good. When she came to you, were you like, are you sure? <laughs> no, I said, no, why? That was my actual, my, the truest response was, yes. no, why? <laughs> what are y'all going to sing for us? We are going to sing our lead single, Feels Good. Oh, I can't wait. Take it away. Bubbling on the stove Ooh, A little southern slang Banging on the radio Deep in wood grain It's on the interstate Get back on a Sunday Cut that stereo on Send it to
Today's show. We love y'all. Oh y'all gosh, are incredible. Y'all amazing. Y'all download this. Oh my gosh, we wanted their debut album. It's called Blood Harmony. It drops August 11th. Tickets for their tour on sale now. Yes, are y'all going all over? All over. You can 20 see us. Cities. 22 cities. Yeah. Get there. All right, we'll be back right after this. Tomorrow, supermodel Ashley Graham brings the Barbie dream house to life. Oh, and one of our favorite celebrity chefs, Sunny Anderson, is going to serve up summer on a plate. Oh, I hope you guys have a good Wednesday. Uh, we will. See you Thursday. <laughs> tomorrow. There are dozens of Chinatowns all across America with interesting architecture, diverse restaurants, and specialty shops. It's no wonder they're popular with locals and tourists alike. 
They also provide places for new immigrants and for families to create communities. But with gentrification and all sorts of problems from the pandemic, it's no wonder that all these Chinatowns are rapidly changing. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Okay, so it's no surprise. There's incredible food to be found here in Manhattan's Chinatown, folks lining up all the time. But there used to be Chinatowns in cities and towns, big and small, all across this country. In fact, the longest running family owned Chinese restaurant is in a place you might never think of, Butte, Montana. At the turn of the century, Butte, Montana was a bustling mining town. The invention of electricity leading to a demand for conductors like copper. Mining boomed, the city flourishing. The demand for labor brought thousands of immigrants to Butte. They came from so many different countries, including Italy, Ireland, and China. It was the classic portrait of the American West, with gambling, saloons, even a red light district. By 1914, Butte's Chinatown was thriving with over 60 Chinese-owned businesses. Now we're going to prepare broccoli beef. My name is Jerry Tam, and I'm the owner of the Pekin Noodle Parlor. The Pekin first opened as a tobacco shop and casino run by Jerry's great uncle, Hum Yao. Two years later, Hum adding a restaurant, and the Pekin Noodle Parlor was born. Well, this building has three different levels. The top level, obviously, is the Pekin Noodle Parlor. And then the second level on the main street used to be a herbal medicine shop. That shop was run by Jerry's great-grandfather, Tam Kuang Yi. It's crazy to think that, you know, everything came over from China at one time. Like, they didn't make soy sauce in America. The noodles were fried and brought over on ships because they didn't make fresh noodles. So the history of this place really holds true that this is a Chinese restaurant, you know, from Chinese immigrants. I met up with culinary historian Grace Young to learn more about America's earliest Chinatown. Where was the first Chinatown and how did it get started? The first Chinatown is San Francisco. The first Chinese came to California uh, for the gold rush and that was 1848. And uh, they came because America needed cheap labor. And so from Gold Rush, they ended up doing farming, mm. manufacturing, and then eventually they worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. And the first Chinatown formed because America wanted cheap labor, but they didn't want the Chinese to live with whites. So they were ostracized from white communities. So t talk to me about that first wave of, of Chinese immigration to the U.S. The Chinese came from southern China, from principally from the area of Canton, and there was tremendous prejudice against mm -hmm. the Chinese. They were lynched, and because the Chinese were willing to work for lower wages, they were seen as the reason why Americans were suffering so much. So the blame mm -hmm. was unfairly placed on the Chinese. In 1882, Congress signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law. It banned Chinese from migrating to the U.S. It marks the only time in American history that an entire race or ethnic group was banned from immigrating. But the interesting thing about this Exclusion Act was that there was actually exemption for Chinese tourists, students, teachers, and also merchants. A landmark court case in 1915 classified Chinese restaurant owners as merchants. And it gave them a way to circumvent the Exclusion Act of 1882. It was this exemption that allowed Jerry's great uncle to open Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, paving a path for more family members to immigrate to the U.S. and help the business. Jerry's father, Danny Wong arrived in the U.S. in 1947 as a teenager. Ever since he was 14 years old, he's been working at the Pekin Noodle Parlor, and he just started with the simple rolls of washing dishes, and then he learned how to cook, 
and then he slowly just started integrating himself into you know, managing it and working with the waitresses and the staff. Danny taking over the restaurant in the 1950s, spending years turning it into a pillar of the local community. Well, I've been coming here for at least 50 years, and they give me plenty of food. I never walk away hungry. I love coming to work because of all the people I work with. Like, they choose really nice people. And I mean, my father probably employed over 10,000 people at this, you know, throughout his whole entire life. So it's interesting to know that there's nearly five to six generations of people that, you know, have worked here. The menu at Pekin Noodle Parlor hasn't changed much over the years. We do a thing called chop suey. And what chop suey is, is tidbits of leftover uh, vegetables that were kind of mixed together in its own gravy and served on top of chow mein noodles. We've been serving it for over 110 years. Chop suey is in large part why Chinese food became so popular across the United States. Chop suey was the first time America experienced a culinary craze, a food craze. Mm -hmm. And it's starting at the end of the 19th century that there are Americans who are venturing into Chinatown. The way they got them to even experiment with Chinese food was to make a stir fry that was actually quite bland. Mm -hmm. So they used bamboo shoots, water chestnuts, onions, uh, oftentimes there was celery. For many years, Chinatowns were the only places where non-Chinese Americans could sample Asian flavors. Americans were going into Chinatown, some were curious, they wanted to experience curio shops, Chinese operas. With increased tourism, Chinatowns and large cities grew, but it was a different story in Montana. Like many mining towns, Butte lost many of its workers as production slowed in the 1950s. Once the copper ran dry, then the people just started to pick up and just kind of move on, move on and move back to their families and the bigger states. As miners left Butte for new opportunities, its Chinatown disappeared. In the early 1900s, there were seven chop suey restaurants listed in the Butte City Directory. Today, only the Pekin Noodle Parlor remains open. Jerry Tam runs the Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, Montana. People may know this is the oldest Chinese restaurant in America, but below it is so much history. Despite Pekin's historic status, Jerry says he was never pressured by family to join the business. I never learned to cook until I came back, uh, back in around 2009, because my any Asian American, my parents wanted all of their kids to go to college, so we all went to colleges around the nation and to get a better education, to become a lawyer, a doctor, and what have you. But I went into fashion, and what was great about that is I got to see the world because of it. In 2004, Jerry even appearing on Bravo's Project Runway. But a few years later, family duty calling him home. And unfortunately, my mom had a stroke, so my dad needed help. 
you know, taking care of her and take care of the restaurant. I think it was really hot on my father because they were in a generation where they loved each other every day. And they were just best friends. After Jerry's mom passed, Jerry and his dad began operating Pekin together. He never stopped working, so he was working here all the way until 85, until he couldn't make up the stairs anymore. My father and I spent every day together. I made sure he was, uh, he was healthy all the way till the end, the best of my ability I can do. My, my father passed in November, and it was really, you know, heartbreaking. He didn't want to say goodbye to my sisters or me or this restaurant or the community. He loved View, Montana. Jerry now runs Pekin Noodle Parlor with his cousin, Nelson. Together, they're working to preserve a family legacy and keep a piece of Chinese American history alive in an unlikely place. I've been asked the question, what is the future of the Pekin? And the best answer I can give you is, let's just keep it the same. Let's not change anything, because that's what people come here for. They have their parking spots, they have their booths, they have their favorite place to sit at the bar. I don't think they want any change, because this is a place that feels like home. While New York City is home to America's largest Chinatown, the honor of the oldest goes to San Francisco. And that's where the Far East Cafe is located. It is one of the last remaining historic Chinese banquet halls. After a two year hiatus, this celebrated venue hosted the 64th annual Miss Chinatown USA pageant, a Lunar New Year tradition. The occasion marking a triumphant milestone for this century-old institution. Bill Lee has owned the Far East Cafe since 1999. His daughter Kathy working by his side as the manager. He brought me into the restaurant to kind of understand the roots of our culture. He wanted me to remember that, you know, Chinatown is about community, is about traditions, is about culture. For many in the community, Chinese banquet halls are more than just venues for special events. I feel that Far East is kind of like a second home for, you know, a lot of our patrons that come in because they feel so comfortable. So much history and so many memories, you know. A lot of patrons that have been here, they've told me, they're like, oh, my parents had my red egg ginger party. It's very similar to like a baptism. And that was like 50 something years ago. And that history is everywhere you look at Far East.
the ceilings, the, like my dad mentioned, the high ceilings, the moldings, the moldings are all original. And the lanterns were all imported from China uh, in the 1920s. So they're over 100 plus years old. For the last few decades, there were five giant banquet style restaurants in San Francisco's Chinatown. But with rising rents and gentrification, most have since closed their doors. By early 2020, only two banquet halls remained. The Far East Cafe planned to celebrate its 100 year anniversary with a big celebration. Instead, it's now planning to close its doors. At the start of the pandemic, the restaurant stayed afloat by cooking meals for senior citizens and low income residents in Chinatown. We applied for a PPP loan and we got over $200,000. We also received money from the feed and fuel program. Then our landlord gave us six months of free rent. Beyond COVID, a different type of virus brought more harm to Chinatowns across the country. Anti-Asian hate crimes soaring by nearly 340% in 2021. When this started happening, I felt very, very sad and also very angry because I'm like, why is this happening to Chinatown? Why is it happening to our community? You know, for these people to target elderly people, to push them down, to rob them, don't they realize that they have grandparents too, or they have parents that are that age? And if that happened to their parents, how would they feel? Then People saw the attacks when they watched the news and heard reports, and they got even more scared. They don't want to go out, even for special events like the Mid-Autumn Festival. We tried to invite them, but they didn't want to come. We used to be open until 10 o'clock before pandemic. Sometimes we would stay out here until midnight if we had events. Now, we can't, we can't do that. We changed the business hours to close at 7, 7.30, because safety is the most important thing. Business owners across Chinatown still face hostility. George and Cindy Chen opened China Live in 2017. We've been lucky. Uh, we've only had a couple instances where, you know, people scream uh, anti-Asian slurs. And we're concerned about our employees, you know, coming to work and, and being harassed. I, I think that ignorance is uh, very unfortunate. China Live is a massive marketplace with multiple restaurants. It's in a building that once housed a banquet hall like Far East. I remember coming to a wedding here when I was in college. And there were, I think, I think literally 5,000 people in like six restaurants. But unfortunately, you know, real estate was getting very expensive. So it's not very cost effective if you don't have that business. But two years ago, the couple had to lay off 200 workers. However, with the support of partners, George and Cindy were able to pivot their business on a few fronts. We did, you know, the ghost kitchen was selling outside our box. So we have 10 locations in the Bay Area, from San Jose to Berkeley, and, uh, and they can order food from those ghost kitchens. Ghost kitchens prepare restaurant quality food exclusively for delivery or takeout. We sold so many Peking ducks, we didn't know what to do with all the duck fat. So what do you do? You make popcorn with it. So that's why we have a duck fat popcorn. As business picked up, China Live was able to rehire 100 workers. Despite an uncertain future, these restaurants remain hopeful that business will rebound. More police presence, People are more, as a community, standing up for ourselves, making sure that we have like the buzzy system, making sure that we're together and we feel safe, that we're walking together, that we have each other's back. I mean, dining out is an essential part of life, right? I mean, one more fun is to look forward to having dinner with friends you haven't seen at a new place or a old favorite place. But some old favorites just can't be replaced. During the pandemic, many restaurants have shut down. Far East is now the biggest restaurant in Chinatown. If Far East closes, there won't be space big enough to host large events for the community. We were overjoyed having that 
Miss Chinatown USA event here, a press conference, and just being able to reconnect with the community, it warmed my heart. And my dad was just like so overjoyed that people were coming in just to celebrate. To learn more about the future of Chinese American restaurants, I went to visit Chef Lucas Sin in New York City. This savvy chef is on a mission to save mom and pop shops from closing and putting a spin on the classics. Hey, nice oh, to meet good you. To see you. All right, can't wait to yeah, talk come and in, taste. Come in, come in here, come in here. Lucas was born and raised in Hong Kong. Growing up, he had never heard of dishes like General Tso's chicken. What was your first experience with Chinese American food? Yeah. And did you go, what the heck is this? I was here for summer camp, and uh, on Tuesdays, at 10 o'clock or so, right before bedtime, this van would pull up in the front of the school, um, and you could pick between sesame chicken, general Tso's chicken, orange chicken with broccoli and fried rice or white rice or whatever it was. The first thought was that this is ridiculously delicious, where has this been my whole life? And the second thought is that what in the world is the difference between orange chicken and general Tso's chicken and sesame chicken? Why is there so much that I don't understand about this if last time I checked I was Chinese? Lucas actually studied cognitive science at Yale, but he always had a passion for cooking. His summers spent training in award-winning restaurants in Hong Kong and Japan. After graduating in 2015, Lucas opened his first restaurant with Yale classmate Yang Zhao. Junzi Kitchen is a fast casual chain that serves modern Chinese fare. But Lucas remained passionate about the Chinese American cuisine he first tasted as a boy. So, so how did Chinese American food, the food that we have become uh, familiar with, how did that develop? How yeah. did that happen? Now, Chinese takeout is interesting, right, because it's all over the United States. Right? So these folks come in, they yeah, yeah. apprentice in a restaurant, right. they learn those recipes, and they then go move somewhere on else, right? To open their own exactly. restaurant. And then their cousins come from Fujian, and then those recipes are passed on. And there's a remarkable similarity to, to, to these dishes. Despite the popularity of Chinese American food, many family owned restaurants that once dotted Chinatowns and other urban areas have been closing for years. Opening restaurants is really difficult, and running restaurants is perhaps even more difficult. These moms and dads open these restaurants so that their kids can go to university and become lawyers and doctors and television hosts and whatnot. And now that they're finally able to do that, they don't need to run these restaurants anymore, right? The li suddenly, livelihoods have changed. That's a good thing. Lucas and Young hatched an idea to help smaller businesses in 2019. Nice Day seeks out restaurants facing closure, then works with the owners to remodel the space and update the menus. The pandemic stalled the team's initial plans, but the second location in Long Island is slated to open this spring. It's important to me that these new Chinese American takeout restaurants that we're building called Nice Day 
work with the previous generation of owners because they have a lot of knowledge that mm -hmm. we don't. They know their customers, they know what sells, um, they know how to cook these dishes, they have recipes. You raise an interesting point, Lucas, mm -hmm. in that you talk to these retired mm -hmm. Chinese restaurant owners. I is that part of the, the, the sense of trying to memorialize mm -hmm. what could be lost? Now, preserving recipes is part of it. But the other important part is preserving the way business is done. Chinese takeout restaurants are one of the few restaurants in the world that if they're open from, let's say, 11 to 10, the work hours are 11 to 10. They don't have any prep hours. The same cooks that do the walk stir fries are also prepping during the day. It's ridiculously efficient, and it's got to do with the setup and the way that the kitchens are run. But it's also important to us that we give back to this last generation and that we can make sure that owners who want to retire can retire well and that that legacy can be preserved in a new type of American Chinese takeout restaurant. While Nice Day pays homage to popular Chinese American recipes, Lucas has been celebrated for his innovative fusion dishes. In 2021, he was named one of Food and Wine's best new chefs. We serve a Mapo mac and cheese yeah. here, which yeah. is a variation on that dish. It's fusion-y and it's silly and it's just an attempt to do something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it betrays every chef sensibility that I have, but unfortunately it's delicious and it's interesting and it gets people talking. Finally, it's time to eat. Lucas showing me how to make his signature dish. How do we get started? So the mapo mac and cheese, the mac and the cheese elements are rigorously American. Mm -hmm. These are, This is elbow macaroni right? Uh, cooked halfway. And this is Velveeta. Um, but the mapo element is going to be in the form of a mapo sauce, if you will. The last two elements that really sort of take this over the edge is um, Chinese sausage. Oh. It, it can function like bacon and some dried shiitake mushrooms that we've rehydrated. So um, to start off with, we're just gonna cut a couple of things. And this tofu, we will then put into the deep fryer. Mm -hmm. This concludes the chopping portion of our program. <laughs> Next, garlic and ginger are cooked till fragrant. Then, spicy bean paste and soybean paste are added to start the sauce. Mushroom broth is added, the mixture brought to a boil so the flavors infuse. Can I give that a try? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's here you go. So your left hand's on the walk? Yeah. Yes. I can't, I, can't get, I can't get any altitude on this thing. Nothing's coming up. That's why the pros do it, baby. At this point, everything's smelling quite good. Uh -huh. So the macaroni is going to go in, as well as the soup we just made. Once it's boiling and happy, two slices of the best of the best. Velveeta. Velveeta American cheese. Wait for that Velveeta to melt. Uh -huh. You see that that sauce is already beautifully tied together. We like to play this dish in the Chinese takeout box. Oh, wow. Because it's silly. Why, um, why not? <laughs> it's fun. Boom. Some fried tofu puffs as croutons go over the top. That's a little bit of texture and the homage to the original mapo tofu. These fresh scallions are actually really important because they cut through the heaviness mm -hmm. of the original dish. Wow. Just a little spice, the creaminess, the crunch of the, the tofu. I hope you get, yeah, get a little, little bit of the of sausage. sausage, yeah. Whoa, you've never had mac and cheese like this. <laughs> <laughs> Amid a global pandemic, changing family dynamics, and anti-Asian racism, Chinatowns across America and the communities that sustain them face a challenging road ahead. Every business that is open right now is still fighting for its life. And I think that the best way to fight the anti-Asian hate is to show our love for the community. Come to Chinatown or your local Asian American Pacific Islander restaurant, store, market, give them your business. We have lost so much during the pandemic and I think it makes us all so much more conscious that we have to protect what we love.
Ah, the avocado. From toast topping to sweet treats, even mac and cheese, this tasty green fruit is pretty much everywhere. But did you know the most popular variety, the Haas avocado, was developed right here in Southern California. So I came all the way across the country to find out how farmers and restaurant owners are making sure we're enjoying these for years to come. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We call this right here the avocado tunnel of love. <laughs> In the past 20 years, believe it or not, avocado consumption has tripled in the United States. Today, the average American eats eight pounds of these babies every year. I'm at Rancho Vasquez, one of the oldest avocado orchards in the country. Here, the Vasquez family grows several different varieties. Let's avocado check it out. Oh, welcome to Rancho Vasquez. Art? Yes, Nice Art. to meet you. How's it going, sir? Damien Vasquez. Damien, nice welcome to see to the you range. guys. Army veteran Art Vasquez has turned his love for avocados into a true family obsession. Four generations live together on this scenic ranch. Many of them work in the orchard and help run the business. I've never been to an avocado farm. Wow. So, this will be gonna, a lot of fun. You guys going to give me a tour? Absolutely. All right, let's go. Art's grandfather, Refugio Morones, moved to the U.S. from Mexico in the 1920s. He picked avocados and citrus fruit on several farms, but always dreamed of having his own orchard. When Art was seven, the family purchasing their first acre of this ranch. And that's when my grandfather, Refugio, would start teaching me how to take care of the trees. That's when I, I really started loving picking. My brother and I would pick the avocados, take the avocados down to the town, knocking on doors, selling the avocados. Art put his passion for produce on hold to pursue a career in the auto parts industry. In 2002, he was able to buy the entire property, which was destined to be raised for new houses. We've taken it from 250 trees all the way up to 3,750 trees. This is something, a sustainable legacy that I can leave here and teach my children, grandkids, and the family how to work the earth how to grow things organically. Art had also saved a piece of Golden State history. Avocados are native to Mexico, but some of the first avocado trees in the U.S. were planted in L.A. County in the mid-1800s. Henry Dalton, a wealthy trader who owned ranches in California, fell in love with the fruit during trips to Central America. In 1848, Henry planted the first avocado tree in Azusa. So when he moved to Los Angeles and he took over and bought Rancho Azusa, he knew there was fresh water coming from the Azusa Canyon. And so because of having the fresh water source and the awesome soil, he knew avocados would be great here. During a tour of the ranch, I got to see a living part of that history. What makes it special is one of the first planted avocado trees in the Western United States. This puppy is one of a kind. It's like us, Al. It's one of a kind, okay. <laughs> and it's still producing fruit? Still producing fruit. It produces anywhere between 500 to six, 700 pounds of fruit a year. Experts estimate this tree is more than 100 years old. It produces a type of avocado known as the fuerte, in Spanish meaning strong. It was the first avocado variety to thrive in the United States because it can withstand cooler temperatures. But in the 1920s, a new variety emerged in SoCal that would ultimately dominate the world market. A guy by the name of Rudolf Haas, he was actually a postal carrier, but his hobby was growing. So he had an orchard at his house about 20 miles from here, La Habra Heights. The Haas avocado was a total accident. An amateur farmer, Rudolf had purchased some mystery avocado seeds. When the tree matured, he was surprised by the dark, bumpy fruit it produced. And that really took off commercially because it has a thicker skin. So for shipping purposes, and it's an amazing tasting fruit. 
The Fuerte and many other avocados stay green when mature, but the skin on a Hass turns black when ripe, hiding any bruises. It didn't take off right away among consumers in the U.S., so it took a few marketing campaigns for Americans to embrace this creamy variety of the fruit. This fourth, put a little green in your red, white, and blue. Today, 80% of avocados grown worldwide are Hass. Now here, this is one of the first Haas trees commercially ever planted. We've got two Haas trees right here. Until the 90s, the majority of avocados consumed in the country were grown in California and weren't available year round. But all that changed in 1994. President Clinton made NAFTA the law today, linking the United States to Canada and Mexico in one large trading block. When NAFTA passed, avocados from Mexico became available everywhere, and folks could enjoy them anytime. Today, even named avocado toast a top trend of the 2010s. Avocado toast. I'm not sure how this happened, but there came a time in the past 10 years when people began to realize that their lives were not complete without it. Thanks to clever campaigns, new diet trends, and an abundant supply, avocado consumption has boomed in the last two decades, growing into a multi-billion dollar industry. Now, 90% of those avocados come from Mexico. However, this has led to major environmental impacts like deforestation. Rancho Vasquez wants to combat the negative effects of monoculture farming. As an organic orchard, they follow strict guidelines to help protect the land. How have the trees and what you grow tried to lessen the impact on the environment? We pick the weeds by hand. Are we weedy? Because it's all organic. Yeah. So we don't ever spray any weed killer or anything like that. The deer come and eat all the lower leaves and skirt the trees for us. Ah. And they turn that into natural manure. Now, when it comes to picking, avocados require a gentle touch. So we still do it the same high-tech way they did it 100 years ago. Wow. You and this is my grandfather's pole? pole right here. Really? Yeah, this is one of the old school ones. So you can pick any of these you want. Okay. So yeah, you just slide it right up till the avocado goes in the basket, and then you pull on the rope. There you go, you're almost there. Pretty difficult, you're doing pretty darn yeah. good, you know? A little bit further, and then pull the rope. There you there go, you is. got it. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> He's ready to use a catch. Ta-da! There you go, My that's first a nice avocado. one too. It's gonna take a week to a week and a half right now to ripen and let it get soft. How about going and tasting some? Yes, sir. We picked some about a week or so, so they'd be perfect for you. All right, let's do it. Believe it or not, there are more than 400 varieties of avocados. Rancho Vasquez in Azusa, California sells six. The Fuerte, Hass, Lamb Hass, Reed, Pinkerton, and Gem. Each has a different shape, taste, and growing season. I've never seen such a, like, a round avocado. The ranch's avocados are prized by chefs and customers for their high oil content. That comes from the area's climate, nutrient-rich mountain soil, 
and secret farming techniques that have been passed down for generations. The higher the oil content, the better the tasting fruit is. And then the longer it'll stay green. You can taste and see the difference with their organic hash. It just keeps it really fresh. Oh, you can literally fresh. see the oil coming out of that. Yeah. So if you want to try just a little chunk, we'll give you a little chunk. Oh, that's great. Next up, the family favorite, Fuerte. Oh, a real, really a different flavor. Absolutely, absolutely. There's almost, it's almost like a saltiness and a creaminess in there. Aside from his wife's guac, Art's favorite way to eat avos is actually with honey. Ooh. It's called avocado dulce. It's avocado candy. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Isn't it great? I would have never thought of that. Guys, this is just amazing. What does it mean for both of you to, to be owners of this, of this legacy? This is a legacy I do want to leave. My family, my grandkids, Damien. And this will be around for, I'm hoping and praying, for at least another 100 years, you know? And what does it mean for you, Damien? Oh, it's like he said, just a place where history can keep going. Because the trees were here before us, and they're going to be here after us. So we're just kind of stewards of the land in the meantime. Let's share a little of this guacamole. Yes, sir. Yep. Let the chips fall where they may, as long as they've got guacamole on them. Avila's El Ranchito is a Southern California staple that's been in business for more than half a century. They've got 13 locations and counting of this family-run chain, but no two restaurants are exactly the same. Every Avila's owner puts their own spin on the family's traditional Mexican recipes. But here at the Seal Beach Outpost, they claim to have the best guacamole. So I've come to learn their secrets. It's time to guac and roll. Hey there, wow, got a lot of folks here. The aunts, uncles, siblings, and cousins behind Avalas El Ranchito really treat their guests like family. This location is run by Elise Avila Smith, a third generation restaurateur. She credits the family's success to her grandma Margarita's hospitality. You know, she just focused on really what we focus on good, fresh food. Salvador and Margarita, or Mama Avila, immigrated from Mexico to the U.S. in 1958. How did they get into the restaurant business? My father had an opportunity to buy a restaurant, and 
talked to my mother and decided, you know, this is a great opportunity. Salvador using his life savings to purchase the old restaurant property in Huntington Park. He turned to his six kids, including Elisa's dad, Victor, for support. We would go after school and help them do whatever needed to be done. And my father was pretty much during the day taking care of the whole restaurant, and my mother was in the kitchen. So she was in the only one in the kitchen. And then, Grandpa Polder was well, washing yeah. dishes. Mama's traditional recipes have been passed down through many generations. They've come from way, way back in Mexico. When it first opened in 1966, Avila's was the only Mexican restaurant in the mostly white neighborhood. Many customers had no interest in Mama's traditional dishes, so she developed a strategy to draw people in. It seemed like natural for my mother to offer the people whatever they wanted, so mm. it was more like a home. If they didn't have it on the menu, then my mother would go in the kitchen and make it anyway. Over the next three decades, the Avila siblings opened six new restaurants in Southern California. This expansion wasn't a coincidence. Americans at the same time were falling in love with Mexican food. In the early 80s, there were an estimated 2,500 Mexican restaurants in the U.S. Today, there are more than 60,000. I was busting tables here as a child. <laughs> Elise witnessed that growth as a kid, watching her dad expand the family business. So I grew up doing homework in a booth. On top of that, I grew up with my grandparents living one street over from me. So I grew up cooking with her for years and years. After college, Elise tried working in other fields, but she was always drawn back to the restaurants. I'd be working by day, you know, I worked for a magazine. And then my brother opened his first restaurant and I ended up serving tables at night. So no matter what I did, I kept ending up back in this business. And I loved it. I realized that this was my passion, it's in my blood. How do you qualify to open up a, an Avila? Well, it's process, let me tell you. <laughs> Is it really? I had to work every position in the restaurant. So I washed dishes, I worked in the kitchen for a few years, but I've done it all. After proving herself for a decade, Elise opened her own Avalas in 2015. When I first opened my restaurant, I worked for several months from about six in the morning till midnight. And finally, I remember my dad and my brother came in for an intervention and said, you need to go home. You gotta sleep. <laughs> you gotta sleep. So I went home and they ran my restaurant for the night. And I knew with my dad and my brother here, there was nothing to worry about. Uh -huh. Every Avila's restaurant is unique, reflecting the family member who owns it and the location. They have different decor and specialty menu items. Elise puts her own spin on the brand by offering an extensive tequila cocktail menu. Dad, I'm gonna make you a drink right now. Make it strong. <laughs> Salud, mija. But there are several dishes you're gonna find at every location. Avocados are crucial to many of the family recipes, including the signature guacamole and their beloved chicken soup. Tell me right. about Mama Avila's soup. That soup that feels like home to me, but it is a chicken breast and rice soup. We make it from scratch every morning, including the broth. We put fresh avocado, cilantro, onion, and tomato in it. And people go, and the first thing they do when they get off the plane is go to have some chicken soup. You mentioned avocado goes into the soup. Tell me about the importance of avocado. It's part of our culture. Bottom line is nobody wants to eat Mexican food without avocado and some guacamole. <laughs> so I'm curious, first you, Victor, what's the secret to a good guacamole? You have to make it, you know, almost really as on a daily basis, almost an hourly basis. It needs to be fresh. It needs to be well seasoned. And a little bit of love. I like to think I make a good guac, but I, <laughs> I'm sure I can learn from the best. So how about showing me how you guys do guac? Before making some guac, I enjoyed a cucumber margarita and got a taste of Mama's famous soup. That's great. I would never think about avocado in chicken soup. Oh my God. I can't take credit for that one, Al. That's all grandma. <laughs> all right, you ready to make some guacamole? You bet. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna dump some fresh garlic in here. Okay. This is a traditional mocha hete. From there, you're gonna sprinkle a little bit of salt just on top. Just a little, just bit, a of little salt. bit of love. And then you're gonna use the top to go ahead and grind it in there. A mocha hete, a Mexican mortar and pestle, is made from volcanic rock. And it's the family secret to great guac. The rough surfaces help crush the ingredients, releasing their natural oils better than chopping them up with a knife. And we're gonna get in some fresh avocado. All right. 
And then you go ahead and mix that together. And I gotta be gentle with the oh, avocado soft. With, with some be love. Gentle, gentle. In go diced onions, lots of cilantro, and a good squeeze of lime juice. Keep on mixing there, and you got yourself some good, fresh guacamole. I'm gonna dig in here with you too, Al. Mm. Oh yeah. You make good guacamole, Al. <laughs> I've learned from the best. Elise, to be part of something like this, what, what does it mean? Honestly, I feel compelled to keep these beautiful recipes that are from, gosh, my great-great-grandparents running so that everyone that comes to our restaurant is able to taste them and to sit at our table and feel like family and just be a part of ours. Cheers. How does a ceviche bar a little different from a, a sushi bar? It's like a sushi bar, but more Mexican. Uh huh. <laughs> this lively food court is home to several family owned hidden gems. In fact, here you'll find Holbush, a modern eatery renowned for its sustainable seafood. The chef behind this vibrant menu pairs flavors from his childhood in Mexico with the freshest of California fare. Gilberto Satina never thought he would dedicate his life to cooking but his summers spent on the Yucatan Peninsula would later inspire a bold move. Since I was a teenager, growing up in the coastal region, I would go diving with my cousins. We would dive down for octopus, uh, we'd get lobsters, we'd get sea snails, and then he would take that back and cook it. And that was one of the first times that I felt a direct connection to food because even back then, there was a disconnect, you right. know? Food came from the supermarket. And it was the first time I saw something that was like directly from the sea and you can cook it and eat it right away. So that kind of blew my mind. Gilberto immigrated to the U.S. when he was five years old. His father, Gilberto Sr., a former civil engineer, worked various restaurant jobs to support the family. How did your family transition from that kind of grassroots sort of food service to right. a real formal restaurant? It, it really was through the help of the nonprofit that, you know, operates Mercado La Paloma. This bustling market is run by Esperanza, or Hope, a nonprofit dedicated to revitalizing South Los Angeles and helping first-time business owners. They gave us small business training, basic you know, restaurant health department training. They co-signed loans so my dad could purchase the equipment. It was my dad's dream to have a restaurant that represented our Mexican food, the food of the Yucatan, which is very distinct from other regions of Mexico. In 2001, Gilberto Sr. opened the family's first restaurant, Chichen Itza. The menu featuring traditional dishes like conchinita pibil, salbutes, and panuchos. Lo empezamos la mamá de Gilberto y yo, o sea, mi esposa y yo. En, al principio éramos dos personas nada más. They needed help, but Gilberto was reluctant to join the family business. I didn't want to cook. I didn't want to be in the kitchen because I, I grew up in a household where we always, you know, cooking was always used to make ends meet, like a lot of, you know, immigrant families. So when we opened the restaurant and my dad asked me to come along and help him out for six months, 
I was front of the house. Slowly, I just discovered the cooking and that I enjoyed it and, you know, started learning from my dad. Even without formal training, Gilberto quickly learning the ropes, becoming a savvy businessman. Ten years in, Chichen Itza was thriving with dozens of employees. They even released a cookbook. Con el paso de los años, finalmente empezó a sentir la misma pasión que yo tenía por el negocio. After taking over at Chichen Itza, Gilberto was ready for a new challenge, one inspired by those summer boat trips in Mexico. Where does the name Holbosch come from? So Holbosch is a place. It's an island off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. He wanted to bring tropical, fresh from the sea vibes, along with an elevated experience, to diners in South Los Angeles. When Holbosch opened in the same market, it changed many perceptions of what Mexican food could be. We go outside of the realm of Yucatan and we do food from all different coastal regions of Mexico. Gilberto's fusion dishes allow the freshest fish to shine. Menu staples include seasonal ceviches and an octopus taco. His innovative cooking has wowed locals and critics alike. How does it feel to be nominated for a James Beard Award for this? Mm. After the shock, I think the first thing that I felt was extreme pride in my team. To a certain level, I guess it feels a little bit like validation because we're doing something slightly outside of the box. You look across Mexican cuisine and, and one of the commonalities is the avocado. Why does the avocado work so well across cuisines in Mexico, but especially your cuisine? The pairing of avocado goes extremely well with raw seafood preparations like ceviches and cocktails, and they're very bright, light, and acidic. I think avocado is the perfect complement because it gives it a little bit, you know, creamy richness. That delicate balance is best represented in the shrimp and scallop aguachiles. And I couldn't wait to try making it. So aguachile is super simple. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take, we're gonna make a marinade that's gonna cook or denature our scallops, right? So we're just gonna take some, some cilantro. Uh -huh. Next up, the chili. Serrano peppers bring the heat. Persian cucumbers cool it down. There's a pinch of salt, ice to prevent oxidation, and a squeeze of lime juice. Then the marinade blends for just about a minute. Now, we're just gonna take a bowl. Go ahead and put a couple of uh, spoonfuls of these beautiful Baja California Bay scallops. Ooh, look at those. Now, we're gonna pour the marinade and hold on to the spoon for stirring. Perfect. That's about right. We wanna let that marinate for at least five minutes. Gilberto takes his agua chile to the next level with an avocado rose. After pitting and peeling, it was time to get slicing. Your knife can be straight because your avocado is at an angle, and we're pull oh. cutting. You're just gonna do this, Al. Look. Like that. The key to a great rose? Super thin slices. We're hiring, you know. <laughs> okay. Now the next step. Hands, right? This We're gonna do this, this motion. We're gonna fan out the okay. avocado, right? Okay. So, you see that? Oh, wow. Yeah, there you go. Looking good there. I think that's uh, good enough to roll. You're gonna start at the tip right here, okay. and you just roll this one like that. You see how that's forming a really big flower? Yes. This is a pretty advanced skill, yeah. but I think it's one worth practicing. Oh, yeah. And it's a nice party trick, you know? Sure. Impress your friends. Yeah. So, which one should we use? I <laughs> think that one. Made by the professional. Time to plate it up. That's looking beautiful. You're a lot neater doing this than I am. I'll yeah. take like a spoonful of them and just yeah. drop it on there and then arrange them on the plate. Ah, pro tip. And of course, the finishing touches. Wow. wow. This is our scallop aguachile. And I help make it. Can something this pretty taste as good as it looks? That looks like a good bite. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But yet so simple. Thank you, sir. Al, it was a pleasure. Fantastic. The Haas avocado may have started out as a lucky surprise, but for decades its popularity has been no accident. 
The Mexican-American culinary traditions passed down through the years have made this delicious and nutritious fruit a staple for so many of us across the country. And thanks to generations of enterprising families, this bumpy green fruit is going to have a very long shelf life. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William France Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Ducky Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Ducky Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duck Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Ducky Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po'boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase Jr., and his wife, Leah Lange Chase that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Dookie Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china, she wanted linens, she wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace 
But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chases when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades, from red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Dukey. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. In. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. The gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter Four. Being a fourth generation African-American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy, best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We it's are great enjoying food. everything. Really good. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie to Chase to, to get, get myself my... some gumbo. When, when the service, service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together.
trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X according to Professor Psyche Williams Forson. The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events, just four years apart, sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open, nothing was open, you know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken.
Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. it's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's had. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, so we used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. So gently he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep. They'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Ah, yeah. Wow. Like I feel her. I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. You gotta <laughs> pick, up your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow. That looks perfect. Now this now is you're what, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're person. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning is moist, crisp. Oh. Your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take this piece to go. Oh, I'm gonna pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I can come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and uh, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas, and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ate here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activist Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come through the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, babe. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course, grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crab. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomp and grind of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty, and savory, all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you gotta think blue crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices and you just start whacking that bad boy and get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region. But here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today, and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando. Glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little, and I'm um, 25. <laughs> 
people from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. So good to see you. How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. Pardon me. I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five pants and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for her autograph, they ask her for her picture, they ask her to hold their babies. You know, it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back? Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh -huh. There, it's like walking to somebody's home. That's they're they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel. Oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people. We were here 20 years. It's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886. Started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of, of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. A tray like that is about uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking. And I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you did you think you were gonna end up here? You were gonna be doing this? No. <laughs> no, but it was hard to get away from and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see, see it ending with my parents. So. The pandemic hit. Yes. You really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's honest good, truth. <laughs> which could be a good or a bad. That's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm going to say it's been around 33, 34 years. And I started in the 79, a uh, week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities, but you love each other, and it always works. You know, it always works well. What's really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. 
Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You, 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 you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> it's just a few of them, you know? Just a few. While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Soybean. Soybean, thank you. So excited to have this crab cake. And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created her recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's crab cake recipe? He doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken up salty. Broken salty, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together, right. nothing more. That's right. And the My big head. ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. Oh, look at this. Oh, boy. It was just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. 
The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply. And on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well. He grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There's more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole East Coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. Yeah. How they biting today? This morning they did pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do and let nobody tell you, go get me this or go get me that. 75-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, now bay 15, and I've been at it ever since. Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and I, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. Not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got other jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black water, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it would be no chance of no more black water. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise. And educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. And it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up and coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking.
Back in Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. I'm an artist at heart, so uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, love crab, love crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in DC, so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side. And pretty much I'm just always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food. So learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watched my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you have people standing in line, hundreds of people <laughs> on the block and in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was, it was just may, it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Natasha, my big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, that are people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know. Coming up, I'm going to grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crab. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. And what I know, I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. So you're able to add a little bit. Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix a dish, well, what did you put in this? How did you do? How did you do this? And I would tell him. I said, you don't have to follow to the letter. You know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. 
genius. The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right, patient's ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first what you wanna do is say we have some uh, Marilyn jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just gotta see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So, Glory, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> this sauce particularly is our, our crab sauce mix. So we're going to drizzle a little bit at a time. I don't want to put too much, right. just enough to uh, bind. You got enough foul? Yep, I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's, she's staying by me. I like this. I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about you know when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Uh, start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant? The most popular. Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a, a bar more favorite and you know make it handheld and on, on the go, uh -huh. you know, throw in your hand. Kind of street food. Really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's, it's very popular, other than the taste as well. Right. Well, exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah, because that's, that's You can take taste. it with you, but if it's not right. tasty, right. exactly. right. uh, come back for it. Yeah, so what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab, something like a, a quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. They're gonna sit in the middle. Is that too yep. much? Yeah, mm -hmm. we wanna take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, we wanna put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's perfect right there. That's perfect, right, perfect. <laughs> and we're gonna literally fold them up envelope style. What, what is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And mm -hmm. You know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Hey, Lord, is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! Faster than what I did. Wow! <laughs> Wow, that natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these bad boys up. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Woo! If you had to describe the heart of your cuisine, what is it and, and how does Baltimore uh, kind of part of that? Pretty much my, my story. Uh, I think that connects very well to our Baltimore, you know, because you know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life. And I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about that. And it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore. And they, they watched my journey through the years. And I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure and having Chris around the edges and then things like that. So that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't fly uh -huh. on one particular side too much. And, Want to even fry? Ooh. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made, and this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet, has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, and I try the piece. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Crab cake egg roll. Yeah. Here we go. Wow. Chef Alf, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake. 
tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family. There are dozens of Chinatowns all across America with interesting architecture, diverse restaurants and specialty shops. It's no wonder they're popular with locals and tourists alike. They also provide places for new immigrants and for families to create communities. But with gentrification and all sorts of problems from the pandemic, it's no wonder that all these Chinatowns are rapidly changing. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Okay, so it's no surprise. There's incredible food to be found here in Manhattan's Chinatown, folks lining up all the time. But there used to be Chinatowns in cities and towns, big and small, all across this country. In fact, the longest running family owned Chinese restaurant is in a place you might never think of, Butte, Montana. At the turn of the century, Butte, Montana was a bustling mining town. The invention of electricity leading to a demand for conductors like copper. Mining boomed, the city flourishing. The demand for labor brought thousands of immigrants to Butte. They came from so many different countries, including Italy, Ireland, and China. It was the classic portrait of the American West, with gambling, saloons, even a red light district. By 1914, Butte's Chinatown was thriving with over 60 Chinese-owned businesses. Now we're going to prepare broccoli beef. My name is Jerry Tam, and I'm the owner of the Pekin Noodle Parlor. The Pekin first opened as a tobacco shop and casino run by Jerry's great uncle, Hum Yao. Two years later, Hum adding a restaurant, and the Pekin Noodle Parlor was born. Well, this building has three different levels. The top level, obviously, is the Pekin Noodle Parlor. And then the second level on the main street used to be a herbal medicine shop. That shop was run by Jerry's great-grandfather, Tam Kuang Yi. It's crazy to think that, you know, everything came over from China at one time. Like, they didn't make soy sauce in America. The noodles were fried and brought over on ships because they didn't make fresh noodles. So the history of this place really holds true that this is a Chinese restaurant, you know, from Chinese immigrants. I met up with culinary historian Grace Young to learn more about America's earliest Chinatown. Where was the first Chinatown and how did it get started? The first Chinatown is San Francisco. The first Chinese came to California uh, for the gold rush and that was 1848. And uh, they came because America needed cheap labor. And so from Gold Rush, they ended up doing farming, mm. manufacturing, and then eventually they worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. And the first Chinatown formed because America wanted cheap labor, but they didn't want the Chinese to live with whites. So they were ostracized from white communities. So t talk to me about that first wave of, of Chinese immigration to the U.S. The Chinese came from southern China, from principally from the area of Canton, and there was tremendous prejudice against mm -hmm. the Chinese. They were lynched, and because the Chinese were willing to work for lower wages, they were seen as the reason why Americans were suffering so much. So the blame mm -hmm. was unfairly placed on the Chinese. In 1882, Congress signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law. It banned Chinese from migrating to the U.S. It marks the only time in American history that an entire race or ethnic group was banned from immigrating. But the interesting thing about this Exclusion Act was that there was actually exemption for Chinese tourists, students, teachers, and also merchants. A landmark court case in 1915 classified Chinese restaurant owners as merchants. And it gave them a way to circumvent the Exclusion Act of 1882. 
It was this exemption that allowed Jerry's great uncle to open Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, paving a path for more family members to immigrate to the U.S. and help the business. Jerry's father, Danny Wong, arrived in the U.S. in 1947 as a teenager. Ever since he was 14 years old, he's been working at the Pekin Noodle Parlor, and he just started with the simple roles of washing dishes, and then he learned how to cook, and then he slowly just started integrating himself into you know, managing it and working with the waitresses and the staff. Danny taking over the restaurant in the 1950s, spending years turning it into a pillar of the local community. Well, I've been coming here for at least 50 years, and they give me plenty of food. I never walk away hungry. I love coming to work because of all the people I work with. Like, they choose really nice people. And I mean, my father probably employed over 10,000 people at this, you know, throughout his whole entire life. So it's interesting to know that there's nearly five to six generations of people that, you know, have worked here. The menu at Pekin Noodle Parlor hasn't changed much over the years. We do a thing called chop suey. And what chop suey is, is tidbits of leftover uh, vegetables that were kind of mixed together in its own gravy and served on top of chow mein noodles. We've been serving it for over 110 years. Chop suey is in large part why Chinese food became so popular across the United States. Chop suey was the first time America experienced a culinary craze, a food craze. Mm -hmm. And it's starting at the end of the 19th century that there are Americans who are venturing into Chinatown. The way they got them to even experiment with Chinese food was to make a stir fry that was actually quite bland. Mm -hmm. So they used bamboo shoots, water chestnuts, onions, uh, oftentimes there was celery. For many years, Chinatowns were the only places where non-Chinese Americans could sample Asian flavors. Americans were going into Chinatown, some were curious, they wanted to experience curio shops, Chinese operas. With increased tourism, Chinatowns and large cities grew, but it was a different story in Montana. Like many mining towns, Butte lost many of its workers as production slowed in the 1950s. Once the copper ran dry, then the people just started to pick up and just kind of move on, move on and move back to their families and the bigger states. As miners left Butte for new opportunities, its Chinatown disappeared. In the early 1900s, there were seven chop suey restaurants listed in the Butte City Directory. Today, only the Pekin Noodle Parlor remains open. Jerry Tam runs the Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, Montana. People may know this is the oldest Chinese restaurant in America, but below it is so much history. Despite Pekin's historic status, Jerry says he was never pressured by family to join the business. I never learned to cook until I came back, uh, back in around 2009, because like 
any Asian American, you know, my parents wanted all of their kids to go to college, so we all went to colleges around the nation and to get a better education, to become a lawyer, a doctor, and what have you. But I went into fashion, and what was great about that is I got to see the world because of it. In 2004, Jerry even appearing on Bravo's Project Runway. But a few years later, family duty calling him home. And unfortunately, my mom had a stroke, so my dad needed help, you know, taking care of her and taking care of the restaurant. I think it was really hard on my father because they were in a generation where they loved each other every day. And they were just best friends. After Jerry's mom passed, Jerry and his dad began operating Pekin together. He never stopped working, so he was working here all the way until 85, until he couldn't make up the stairs anymore. My father and I spent every day together. I made sure he was, uh, he was healthy all the way till the end, the best of my ability I can do. My, my father passed in November, and it was really, you know, heartbreaking. He didn't want to say goodbye to my sisters or me or this restaurant or the community. He loved you, Montana. Jerry now runs Pekin Noodle Parlor with his cousin, Nelson. Together, they're working to preserve a family legacy and keep a piece of Chinese American history alive in an unlikely place. I've been asked the question, what is the future of the Pekin? And the best answer I can give you is, let's just keep it the same. Let's not change anything, because that's what people come here for. They need to have their parking spots, they have their booths, they have their favorite place to sit at the bar. I don't think they want any change, because this is a place that feels like home. While New York City is home to America's largest Chinatown, the honor of the oldest goes to San Francisco. And that's where the Far East Cafe is located. It is one of the last remaining historic Chinese banquet halls. After a two year hiatus, this celebrated venue hosted the 64th annual Miss Chinatown USA pageant, a Lunar New Year tradition. The occasion marking a triumphant milestone for the century-old institution. Bill Lee has owned the Far East Cafe since 1999. His daughter Kathy working by his side as the manager. He brought me into the restaurant to kind of understand the roots of our culture. He wanted me to remember that, you know, Chinatown is about community, is about traditions, is about culture. 
For many in the community, Chinese banquet halls are more than just venues for special events. I feel that Far East is kind of like a second home for you know a lot of our patrons that come in because they feel so comfortable, so much history and so many memories. You know, a lot of patrons that have been here, they told me they're like, oh, my parents had my red egg ginger party. It's very similar to like a baptism, and that was like 50 something years ago. And that history is everywhere you look at Far East. The ceilings. But like my dad mentioned, the high ceilings, the moldings, the moldings are all original and the lanterns were all imported from China uh, in the 1920s. So they're over 100 plus years old. For the last few decades, there were five giant banquet style restaurants in San Francisco's Chinatown. But with rising rents and gentrification, most have since closed their doors. By early 2020, only two banquet halls remained. The Far East Cafe planned to celebrate its 100 year anniversary with a big celebration. Instead, it's now planning to close its doors. At the start of the pandemic, the restaurant stayed afloat by cooking meals for senior citizens and low income residents in Chinatown. We applied for a PPP loan and we got over $200,000. We also received money from the feed and fuel program. Then our landlord gave us six months of free rent. Beyond COVID, a different type of virus brought more harm to Chinatowns across the country. Anti-Asian hate crimes soaring by nearly 340% in 2021. When this started happening, I felt very, very sad and also very angry because I'm like, why is this happening to Chinatown? Why is it happening to our community? You know, for these people to target elderly people, to push them down, to rob them. Don't they realize that they have grandparents too, or they have parents that are that age? And if it happened to their parents, how would they feel? Then People saw the attacks when they watched the news and heard reports, and they got even more scared. They don't want to go out, even for special events like the Mid-Autumn Festival. We tried to invite them, but they didn't want to come. We used to be open until 10 o'clock before pandemic. Sometimes we would stay out here until midnight if we had events. Now we can't, we can't do that. We changed the business hours to close at 7, 7.30 because safety is the most important thing. Business owners across Chinatown still face hostility. George and Cindy Chen opened China Live in 2017. We've been lucky. Uh, we've only had a couple instances where you know, people scream uh, anti-Asian slurs. And we're concerned about our employees, you know, coming to work and, and being harassed. I, I think that ignorance is uh, very unfortunate. China Live is a massive marketplace with multiple restaurants. It's in a building that once housed a banquet hall like Far East. I remember coming to a wedding here when I was in college, and there were, I think, I think literally 5,000 people in like six restaurants. But unfortunately, you know, real estate was getting very expensive, so it's not very cost effective if you don't have that business. But two years ago, the couple had to lay off 200 workers. However, with the support of partners, George and Cindy were able to pivot their business on a few fronts. We did, you know, the ghost kitchen was selling outside our box. So we have 10 locations in the Bay Area, from San Jose to Berkeley, and, uh, and they can order food from those ghost kitchens. Ghost kitchens prepare restaurant quality food exclusively for delivery or takeout. We sold so many Peking ducks, we didn't know what to do with all the duck fat. So what do you do? You make popcorn with it. So that's why we have a duck fat popcorn. As business picked up, China Live was able to rehire 100 workers. Despite an uncertain future, these restaurants remain hopeful that business will rebound. More police presence, people are more, as a community, standing up for ourselves, making sure that we have like the buddy system, making sure that we're together and we feel safe, that we're walking together, that we have each other's back. I mean, dining out is an essential part of life, right? I mean, 
One more fun is to look forward to having dinner with friends you haven't seen at a new place or an old favorite place. But some old favorites just can't be replaced. During the pandemic, many restaurants have shut down. Far East is now the biggest restaurant in Chinatown. If Far East closes, there won't be space big enough to host large events for the community. We were overjoyed having that Miss Chinatown USA event here, a press conference, and just being able to reconnect with the community. It warmed my heart. And my dad was just like so overjoyed that people were coming in just to celebrate. To learn more about the future of Chinese-American restaurants, I went to visit Chef Lucas Sin in New York City. This savvy chef is on a mission to save mom and pop shops from closing and putting a spin on the classics. Hey, nice oh, to meet good you. Good to see you. All right, can't wait to yeah, talk come and in, taste. Come in, come in here, come in here. Lucas was born and raised in Hong Kong. Growing up, he had never heard of dishes like General Tso's chicken. What was your first experience with Chinese American food? Yeah. And did you go, what the heck is this? I was here for summer camp, and uh, on Tuesdays, at 10 o'clock or so, right before bedtime, this van would pull up in the front of the school, um, and you could pick between sesame chicken, general Tso's chicken, orange chicken with broccoli and fried rice or white rice or whatever it was. The first thought was that this is ridiculously delicious, where has this been my whole life? And the second thought is that what in the world is the difference between orange chicken and general Tso's chicken and sesame chicken? Why is there so much that I don't understand about this if last time I checked I was Chinese? Lucas actually studied cognitive science at Yale, but he always had a passion for cooking. His summers spent training in award-winning restaurants in Hong Kong and Japan. After graduating in 2015, Lucas opened his first restaurant with Yale classmate Yang Zhao. Junzi Kitchen is a fast casual chain that serves modern Chinese fare. But Lucas remained passionate about the Chinese American cuisine he first tasted as a boy. So, so how did Chinese American food, the food that we have become uh, familiar with, how did that develop? How yeah. did that happen? Now, Chinese takeout is interesting, right, because it's all over the United States. Yeah. So these folks come in, they yeah. Yeah. apprentice in a restaurant, right. they learn those recipes, and they then go move somewhere on else, right? To open their own exactly. restaurant. Exactly. And then their cousins come from Fujian, and then those recipes are passed on. And there's a remarkable similarity to, to, to these dishes. Despite the popularity of Chinese American food, many family owned restaurants that once dotted Chinatowns and other urban areas have been closing for years. Opening restaurants is really difficult, and running restaurants is perhaps even more difficult. These moms and dads open these restaurants so that their kids can go to university and become lawyers and doctors and 
television hosts and whatnot. And now they're, they're finally able to do that. They don't need to run these restaurants anymore, right? The li suddenly, livelihoods have changed. That's a good thing. Lucas and Young hatched an idea to help smaller businesses in 2019. Nice Day seeks out restaurants facing closure, then works with the owners to remodel the space and update the menus. The pandemic stalled the team's initial plans, but the second location in Long Island is slated to open this spring. It's important to me that these new Chinese American takeout restaurants that we're building called Nice Day work with the previous generation of owners because they have a lot of knowledge that mm -hmm. we don't. They know their customers, they know what sells, um, they know how to cook these dishes, they have recipes. You raise an interesting point, Lucas, mm -hmm. in that you talk to these retired mm -hmm. Chinese restaurant owners. I is that part of the, the, the sense of trying to memorialize mm -hmm. what could be lost? Now, preserving recipes is part of it. But the other important part is preserving the way business is done. Chinese takeout restaurants are one of the few restaurants in the world that if they're open from, let's say, 11 to 10, the work hours are 11 to 10. They don't have any prep hours. The same cooks that do the walk stir fries are also prepping during the day. It's ridiculously efficient, and it's got to do with the setup and the way that the kitchens are run. But it's also important to us that we give back to this last generation and that we can make sure that owners who want to retire can retire well and that that legacy can be preserved in a new type of American Chinese takeout restaurant. While Nice Day pays homage to popular Chinese American recipes, Lucas has been celebrated for his innovative fusion dishes. In 2021, he was named one of Food and Wine's best new chefs. We serve a Mapo mac and cheese yeah. here, which yeah. is a variation on that dish. It's fusion-y and it's silly and it's just an attempt to do something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it betrays every chef sensibility that I have, but unfortunately it's delicious and it's interesting and it gets people talking. Finally, it's time to eat. Lucas showing me how to make his signature dish. How do we get started? So the mapo mac and cheese, the mac and the cheese elements are rigorously American. Mm -hmm. These are, this is elbow macaroni right. uh, cooked halfway and this is Velveeta. Um, but the mapo element is going to be in the form of a mapo sauce, if you will. The last two elements that really sort of take this over the edge is um, Chinese sausage. Oh. It, it can function like bacon and some dried shiitake mushrooms that we've rehydrated. So um, to start off with, we're just gonna cut a couple of things. And this tofu, we will then put into the deep fryer. Mm -hmm. This concludes the chopping portion of our program. <laughs> Next, garlic and ginger are cooked till fragrant. Then, spicy bean paste and soybean paste are added to start the sauce. Mushroom broth is added, the mixture brought to a boil so the flavors infuse. Can I give that a try? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, here you go. So your left hand's on the walk? Yeah. Yes. I can't, I, can't, I can't get any altitude on this thing. Nothing's coming up. And that's why the pros do it, baby. At this point, everything's smelling quite good. Uh -huh. So the macaroni is going to go in, as well as the soup we just made. Once it's boiling and happy, two slices of the best of the best. Velveeta. Velveeta American cheese. Wait for that Velveeta to melt. Uh -huh. You'll see that that sauce is already beautifully tied together. We like to play this dish in the Chinese takeout box. Oh, wow. Because it's silly. Why, um, why not? <laughs> it's fun. Boom. Some fried tofu puffs as croutons go over the top. That's a little bit of texture and the homage to the original Mapo tofu. These fresh scallions are actually really important because they cut through the heaviness mm -hmm. of the original dish. Wow. Just a little spice, the creaminess, the crunch of the, the tofu. I hope you get, yeah, get a little, little bit of the sausage. sausage, yeah. Whoa. You've never had mac and cheese like this. <laughs> Amid a global pandemic, changing family dynamics, 
and anti-Asian racism, Chinatowns across America and the communities that sustain them face a challenging road ahead. Every business that is open right now is still fighting for its life. And I think that the best way to fight the anti-Asian hate is to show our love for the community. Come to Chinatown or your local Asian American Pacific Islander restaurant, store, market. Give them your business. We have lost so much during the pandemic, and I think it makes us all so much more conscious that we have to protect what we love. Ah, the avocado. From toast topping to sweet treats, even mac and cheese, this tasty green fruit is pretty much everywhere. But did you know the most popular variety, the Haas avocado, was developed right here in Southern California. So I came all the way across the country to find out how farmers and restaurant owners are making